Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Program and Personnel Committee meeting for um, March 13th, 2023. Um, we will uh, call this meeting to order and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the Republic of the Netherlands, the nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with the uh, first agenda item is the invitation for public comment. Anyone wishing to uh, address the uh, program of personnel committee? Yeah, come right on. Just state your name and uh, just as a, uh, our common practice is three minutes. Um, we're a little looser in the committee meetings, but. Uh, okay. I. I'm Angie Naylor. I'm a Spanish teacher at Vernon Hills High School. I was a teacher at Libertyville High School for 15 years prior. I'm in like my 23rd year or something. And I'm the one who wrote the letter regarding the language lab. So I just wanted to share that as you um, are having your discussion, if there, if you have any questions, there are many language teachers here, and we would be so happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you. That is... Okay. Anyone else wishing to uh, address the committee? Okay. Uh, hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, first item on the agenda is the IHSA membership renewals. This happens every year. The price is right. <laughs> I, I had not gotten that news that they were not charging their members this year. But that's, that's they haven't they haven't charged in a few years, number of years. But uh, this is our normal annual membership renewal for both Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School. Okay. Any questions from the from the board? It's pretty straightforward. We do this every year. It allows our participation in IHSA. So that will be on the agenda for the board meeting later this month. All right, next on the agenda, ombudsman agreement. So ombudsman, uh, we recommend, uh, we will recommend at the board meeting for approval of the alternative education service agreements for 23-24. So we've had a um, longstanding agreement with ombudsman to provide some uh, off-campus program uh, for our students. And so they um, request us in the agreement to look at the number of um, seats to pay for for the year. Um, and we can also, after that, if there's still room in um, at Ombudsman that we can add students in there, but it's you know a little higher cost. And so we contracted last year for two students. We've used our allotment of two students. So we're asking for another two students for next year reserve spots. Okay. Any questions or comments on this? Again, most of us have seen this before. So this is a minimum of two students. So we pay for the first two students, no matter Correct. what. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That will be also on the agenda later this month. Moving right along. Uh, annual certified staff employment recommendations. It's that month. So in the um, agenda, I did try to um, provide with you a timeline going back to the beginning of the year of the sectioning process, um, you know, that it started back in the fall with uh, finalizing our curriculum uh, proposals and the courses um, into then starting the process of course selection with our students. Um, so in January through February, our course selection for our um, current students, nine through 11, but also then uh, our eighth grade students selecting courses. Um, once the course selection is done, then um, the schools, the buildings get together and um, look at the um, students that have signed up for the courses, um, the number of courses, 
Um, and um, then they start to look at the number of sections that we should um, have for each of our courses. And the number of sections are based off of our optimum class sizes, which um, were updated in this contract. Um, they're included in Appendix F of the um, teacher union contract. Um, so we, uh, the buildings go through that process um, as a team. They work together with their department chairs, uh, building administration. Um, then we as a um, district all meet together. Um, so both Libertyville, Vernon Hills, and we evaluate the number of sections for each of those um, departments. And again, you know, looking at um, the optimums and holding to those optimums. Um, there, you know, there's a number of factors that go into um, looking at the number of um, sections that we you know, select. Um, when you look at, um, there are some year-long courses. There are also some semester courses. There are also um, larger courses and some smaller courses. And so sometimes we have to make some tough decisions on whether or not a course will run um, depending on um, the enrollment that um, is in there. So our optimums, um, the big change this year is a lot of our optimums all some of them that were 28 moved to 25 and some of our um, courses that might have been 18 or 22, um, some of the AP courses moved up to 25. So most, for the most part, most of our courses were 25. There are some um, other courses in physical education and um, some of our other courses that um, might be bigger or smaller. Um, so once you have the number of students and you determine try to keep as close to that divisor, optimum as possible, then we determine the number of sections. Again, going back to, there were some tough decisions to make that if, you know, eight students sign up for a course, you know, just, it, it's tough for us to run a semester course with eight students. There were times that we did look at a couple of our uh, courses and um, what we call is we stack the courses. So we, if we have, um, two courses that are very similar and low number of students if the teacher is able to be able to teach both sections in there we try to keep those courses going if possible um we do have one um course that is uh, taught across the district so calculus three uh, currently is taught across the district um it's dual credit course and we have one teacher that is teaching both our burn hills and libertyville students um, and so, you know, once all of the um, sectioning is done, now behind sectioning, there becomes people and our teachers, and we look at, um, you know, our full-time equivalent or our teachers and who can teach the courses, um, <clears throat> taking in, again, to affect, to account the um, teachers that are retiring. Um, so obviously, they're um, not part of determining who will be teaching the courses. Um, when we looked at that um, and finished everything, um, we kind of, we this year again, we the last few years we've been working on trying to get our numbers broken down into different areas. And so I thought this year, you know, we broke it down into classroom full-time equivalent, um, general education. So classroom full-time equivalent in some of our intervention and services. So EL, pause, special services, which was instruction and co-teaching, and then also transition pathways. And then our non-classroom full-time equivalent or FTE, which was our non-instructional assignments, student services, which includes our LST, special services, non-instructional. So you're looking at social worker, psychologist, um, and then again, transition uh, pathways. So when we um, finish with all of the sectioning, um, our total FTE um, change um, in the classroom was down a 0.9. Um, and for our classroom FTE and intervention services, so EL, pause, special services, transition pathways, our uh, total FTE was, FTE was up 0.2. Um, and then non-classroom full-time equivalent, um, we are up um, 1.5 um, in that area. Um, and so um, some of the other, so when you look at overall then for our teaching assignments, we are up 0.8 um, for our staffing. 
So we realized that um, although some of the course requests had declined, so if you look at Libertyville High School, there is course requests down 440 course requests and um, Vernon Hills course requests were down 22. So although there was um, a declining in course requests, some of it was due to, you know, um, declining enrollment at both buildings, but it's also what, a, what the students choose and how many classes they, they choose. So although we were down, we were really only down 0.9 for classroom FTE. Part of that was we knew that with some of the changes in optimums um, that the class is going from 28 to, to 25, um, you know, there would be a slight increase in the FTE. Um, so even though we're down 440 here at um, Libertyville, students uh, receiving special education services, um, there was, um, we project an increase of 23 for next year. Um, and then our uh, students receiving um, EL, we have an increase of our EL services uh, for next year. Now we did make some changes to EL the, um, with some overload and some other additions through this year. And so we think that we are in a good place with the structure of our EL at both schools if we do get any enrollment over the summer. But if we have another big bump like we did this past summer with um, some of our uh, move-ins from um, Ukraine, we may have to make some you know, adjustments. But we're hoping that um, you know, we don't have that big of an increase there in EL. Yeah, we used we used the predictors that we normally have in terms of the trend over the last five years. So last year was a much larger jump. So we build in some cushion room in our EL classes, but didn't want to um, predict who the move-ins were going to be. So just to foreshadow that there may be a request in July or August for additional EL staffing. We we find these. Uh, increasing all year long, though, don't we? Like we're we have kids that are moving into district every week, mm -hmm. so it's kind of hard to plan. So I appreciate the buffer because I'm hearing from friends in other districts that mm -hmm. it's just a continual increase in the numbers of students and trying to find ways to get people to accommodate. You know, they they may have actually finished their year in their previous school and yet they have to go to school. Um, so. Good. And and if you recall the um, this past year we added two A's in our EL program, so luckily we were able to find um, you know um, Russian speaking aid and also a Spanish speaking aid to add. Um, but again, we had some overloads with our instructors in EL, and so we made some changes there um, at both schools. And we're hoping maybe that again we don't have that big increase over summer. If we do. We'll try to get on it right away, though. So, any questions on the that staffing portion before we go on to kind of the employment piece? Um, just a gen general question, but have have all students who applied to be in a class have they all gotten that class right now, or do we still have a population of students who? may not get into the classes they wanted to sign up for? So that's a good question. So if um, the buildings recognize that maybe classes weren't gonna run, just the enrollment was um, so low, you know, like five students had signed up for a class, they were, they were going back to the students right away and try to get them um, into other sections so that when we really did the sectioning, that there's not gonna be movement now here in the spring or summer of those students. So we were um, trying to capture that so that if we section something at, you know, 24 students that, you know, students in a, a, an elective that didn't get it, didn't get piled into a class and then that class optimum increase. So we were trying to catch those um, sooner rather than later this year. Okay. So those those questions, just to be clear, those conversations with students have already taken place. Correct. They're, yeah. One level of yeah. them. There's yeah. a few more classes. Correct. I would say the buildings did a really good job projecting and, and internally deciding which classes they knew couldn't run. Um, but there were a few more added to the list. But the other area where students sometimes have to make choices is when there's conflicts and we actually build the master schedule. 
and German four is offered the same time as some other singleton, even though we try to not do that with, you know, an eight period day, it's impossible. So that's one more round where students, unfortunately, are asked to make a choice between class A and class B. Yeah, there's certain when when Denise says singleton, so, you know, if you sign up for geometry, there might be eight sections of geometry throughout the day. It's easier to fit into a student schedule. But if they sign up for a certain art class, it might only be offered once during the day. And once that schedule is built, sometimes it's hard to piece that student's schedule around and they may not be able to get that. And so then, um, you know, we do may have to move their schedule around. Yeah, um, I mean, I was also thinking about it. There are some classes you can only take in a certain year. Like I think health has to be taken freshman year and you can only take AP government in senior year. I may be getting some of these specifics wrong, but are we like making sure that these students for those types of requirements that they can get into those classes at the right time? I, as far as I know, um, I think of the classes that have low enrollment, it typically are some of the specialty classes. Um, and so we try to, as the school counselors especially work hard at this, making sure students know what is a close alternative. But anything that would be in a sequence, um, we make sure that the student either has that path or a path that's similar in terms of graduation requirements or something else. Thank you. Can, I just wanna, first of all, thank you for putting all this together. Just deciphering this, I can't imagine how much information goes into just creating this, but I want to make sure I understand it. Even though we're down 1 or 0.9 FTE, through the contingency, we're not going to see a change in our staffing. Is that right? Is that why we have the 1 FTE contingency? So the one, the, the one FTE contingency was like this past year when we added some EL. Um, in the past, I know we've added a math section over the summer. Um, at Vernon Hills. Um, so if like we have some move-ins in an area or we need to add, so that contingency is in case we need to add that we don't have to come back to the board and say, and, and ask for. So we're asking for a 1.0 contingency, which allows us that if we need to add an overload or add a teacher, some sections that we can do that without having to come to the board. Just to be clear, it's not somebody we're hiring. It's somebody, it's a placeholder in case. It's budget we reserve. Do right. Yeah. To not eliminate an FTE. Right, right. Right. Anything else? Okay, part B of the... Uh, so then the, the next piece that, that we um, all work on together, so department chairs... Um, work with their teachers on what courses, um, you know, they would like to teach for next year, um, and then with the building administration with us. And so once we, we plug all that in, obviously there are FTE. So again, 1.0 FTE um, is that a teacher is teaching five classes, uh, first semester and uh, five second semester. So really 0.5 and 0.5. So that adds up to 1.0 FTE. So that's that's where you get the the 1.0 FTE. You know there are um, you know there are a couple of things in here when you look at like non instructional assignments. So for example, our um, data coaches, our equity coaches in the building, you know they'll teach um, three classes and they have two assignments off. So there'll be a 0.6 teacher with a 0.4 release and a non instructional. So that's where you get you know these these different uh, points of FTE which is different than like middle school or grade school where you have a third grade teacher and they teach third grade or something like that. Um, and so when we go through the staffing, um, again, um, there wasn't a, there was a decrease in FTE for general education, but increases across the board. So our recommendation is uh, for continued employment of our first, second, third, and fourth year teachers. The fourth year teachers would also then be recommended for uh, tenure. Um, and again, you would um, take action on this at the board meeting. We do have honorable dismissal of um, full-time faculty, which um, is, again, uh, by law, you have to do this so many days before the end of the school year. Um, and the only full-time, oh, we had two leave of absences that were covered um, by uh, staff members. They knew that they were covering one year of uh, absence. Although we hired them to cover a leave, 
legally, we still need to release them um, from their job. So again, they've had conversations that they will be released from um, their positions. The other part that um, the board needs to take action on at the board meeting is non-renewal of part-time faculty. So a part-time faculty member is anyone under 1.0. It could be 0.9 or it could be 0.1, but anyone under 1.0 is considered a part-time. And so by law, you have to release them. Um, and some people call it, a, you know, part-time RIF, but it's a reduction in force. So again, they've had conversations from their department chair to the building that they will be receiving a legal notice from you. So at the board meeting, you will take action um, to release our non-tenured teacher. Some of them may be coming back in positions, um, and we'll, if they're coming back in open positions, um, some of them are part-time positions that they may be offered. You would rehire them again in April. So then we, you know, we go and talk to them and see what sections are available to them. And then we hire them again in April. And part-time doesn't um, allow you to start your process of earning tenure also. So just so you know that the tenure process in Illinois under PARA um, could be um it's, it's normally four years you can accelerate a tenure with three years with three years of excellent you could get also accelerated tenure with portability if you were tenured at another school with two years um but part-time teachers do not um earn any of that process toward okay any questions i have a quick one sure. <clears throat> so this is for um certified faculty mm -hmm. and so i guess when does the the window close for notification of potential rif so uh, i'm just confirming 45 that this days before the end of, end of the school year, year. Yeah. so this is not necessarily is this final so then we um at board action you would take um at next week so I suppose it, what I mean is this list isn't anticipated to change before next it week. It is not going to change. Okay. And then my other question is, do we get a staffing report similar to this for our non-certified staff, our paras, our, I can't remember from you next will, uh, We'll have that at the April board meeting. Cool. Thank you. Good questions. Anything else? Okay. Moving on, we have a... Um, Employment of employees. This is just our our March um, personnel report for employment of employees. Any questions on these? These will be included in the um, consent agenda. Right. Okay. Moving on to letter F, educational I, tours. I will say it's nice to see that we were able to hire someone for specialized yeah. support so quickly because we just approved that. No, good point. Okay, we have uh, three educational tours. Yes, and um, this is the first year that we participated in the DECA competition at Libertyville, and one student was selected to participate at the national competition in Orlando. So they will be uh, going to that in, in April, and that is the International Career Development Conference. And then we have uh, students going to the state conference for uh, future business leaders of America um, in, um, in Springfield. And we also have a net tour plan for our French speaking students for uh, 2024 to um, Canada. Okay, any questions on that? Just a comment that I was happy to see the Canada tour back on the agenda. I know that my daughter went on that one and it was a fabulous tour. So. Happy to happy to see continue to see these come back. So, okay. Hearing no other uh, questions, we'll uh, move on next. Um, those will be on the agenda for um, the board meeting later in the month. Uh, item G: Gender Support Model Overview. So, good afternoon, um, all members of Board of Education, and to our D one twenty eight community. Um, our staff administration. Um, I am here today along with um, some members of the dynamic gender support. I know I have Mr. Gore. Um, I think that's it. I think it's just me and him today. <laughs> 
um, that worked hard on updating um, the gender support model. Um, so again, um, special thanks to um, all of our members um, that participated on the committee. Uh, they helped to create a space um, in which um, all of the members, including um, students and parents that participated on the committee um, were able to share their experiences um, as well as um, contribute and challenge at times um, and um, be able to um, learn from each other. Um, in addition to helping me to review different um, uh, documents as well as um, the presentation and then also some accompanying documents that we still have to finalize. Next slide, I think. Yep, next slide. Yep, next slide on that one. All right, so I want to give a special shout out um, to uh, the member, the student members of the committee. Um, I really want to illuminate their participation in this process. Um, it was absolutely amazing to be in a room with students um, that advocated um, for students that are currently with us, as well as students that will be joining us in years to come. Um, but also to um, be courageous to share their voice um, with something um, that is um, not all the way accepted in which, you know, where it really needs to be. Um, I also want to thank um, the Libertyville High School Gender Sexuality Alliance, as well as the Vernon Hills Sexuality and Gender Acceptance Club for um, allowing me the space to come in and also speak with those students as well. Next slide, please. All right, so I wanted to give a little bit of a background on where the gender support um, plan came from. Um, so back in 2019, Governor Pritzker um, put together a um, committee um, entitled Strengthening Our Commitment to Affirming Inclusive Schools. And his order um, for this task force was to um, create some type of guidance for districts um, to support um, their um, gender, um, their non-conforming, um, transgender, intersex, um, I know I'm forgetting one, uh, non-binary, um, and students questioning their gender um, for um, to support <laughs> as well as to ensure um, that there was no discrimination um, towards the students. Um, in 2020, right before COVID hit, um, the task force presented uh, recommendations in which um, there is now ISB guidance um, specifically for this. However, I want to point out that D128 formed a committee back in 2016 um, and to create a gender support guidance as well as a gender support plan that was used district-wide. So we were actually well, you guys were actually ahead of the curve. <laughs> All right, so um, you'll hear me say gender support plan and gender support model, but we are going um, with the alignment um, of what ISB would like us to call it. So it's the gender support model, and it is a framework um, to um, support um, our transgender, transgender non-binary, and our gender non-conforming um, students according to each of their needs thoughtfully and intentionally with looking at four factors, um, providing tailored support to ensure equal access to educational programming and activities, <laughs> recognizing all risk factors, um, keeping in mind the student's chronological and developmental age, as well as family supports that may affect the process, and then if requested, and if needed, providing um, supports to siblings or other family members that may be also attending the school district. Next slide, please. All right, so um, I also wanna include in this history, a history of where we're at in this alignment to our strategic plan and our equity policy. And as uh, the great Larry Varn, who is sitting with us today says, all means all. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are supporting all of our students. Um, and so here again is our equity um, policy, uh, which um, also focuses on um, 
our students. You can um, go to the next slide. Um, and then um, our vision, which um, says that every child feels seen, heard, and included, which is something that we wanted to make sure that we were doing in this process. Um, and then championing opportunities for every student to be daring. Please go to the next slide. And then again, just a reminder for um, the board and our community of our D128 equity commitments. Next slide. All right, um, so our D128 gender support model um, is designed to provide procedures um, to address our, the needs of our transgender, gender non-conforming, non-binary and intersex students. Uh, within the guidelines, we focus in on um, uh, professional development for our staff. We focus in on um, student records, um, as well as um, making sure that within the guidelines and our procedures that we are creating a culture free of harassment, discrimination, and bullying. Next slide, please. So we had um, four, um, four uh, pillars of focus, I would like to say. Um, we wanted to make sure that we supported our LGBTQ plus and affirming student groups. We wanted to provide um, easily accessible information and supports and make sure that they are communicated to all. Uh, we wanted to ensure accountability for uh, inclusive practices. And then again, as I stated um, before, provide ongoing training and support to all staff members. Next slide. All right. So um, before you, um, our components of the gender support model um, that were previously included in the gender support guidance that was created in 2016, um, with these components, we just updated and or aligned um, each of the areas to what was um, created in the ISB guidance. So some of the some of the areas it was stayed the same, and then in other areas we um, made that alignment to the ISB guidelines. Next slide. So what's new? What was not included in our 2016 um, gender support plan that we included in our model um, are the six areas of focus here. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I do wanna focus on some of what I would like to call um, needs or hot topics for um, our gender support plan. So one component, um, that is a, a new addition, um, is overnight field trips. Um, there was definitely a need for guidance um, for our students and staff in this area um, to provide um, supports and accommodations for overnight trips um, in, um, in respect to our transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, and intersex students, as well as those questioning their gender. So within this area, um, we provide um, specific procedures um, as well as um, communication structures um, for overnight field trips for um, our students. Another area of focus, um, which was not included in the support um, in the gender support in the gender support um, guidance of 2016, was staff in transition. Um, our 2016 guidance only focused in on students and we wanted to expand this to include our um, staff or any incoming staff as we look at um, continuing to diversify um, our staff. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that there was language um, to ensure that our employees career so that our employees career, um, social and emotional success. Um, another area that we um, felt that there was a need to expand was our tra training and professional development. Um, and this is training and professional development that will be provided to all staff. Um, and we will focus in on uh, four areas, terms, concepts, and current developmental understandings of gender identity, gender expression, and gender diversity in children and adolescents. Developmentally, developmentally appropriate strategies for communication with students and parents about issues related to gender identity and gender expression that protect students' privacy, 
developmentally appropriate strategies for preventing and intervening in harassment, intimidation, discrimination, and bullying incidents, include, including cyberbullying, and then last but not least, classroom management practices, curriculum re resources that educators can integrate in their classrooms to help foster a more gender inclusive environment for all students. Last but not least, um, another area that the committee felt was very important was the new facilities and um, additions. Um, there was a firm agreement that there should be consideration um, of additional non-gender bathrooms and or facilities um, that should be included in any discussion and or plans of new additions to existing building structures. Next slide. So moving forward, um, our team um, will finalize the gender support model. Uh, we also have to um, finalize um, some accompanying documents that go along with the model. We also would like to finalize our advocacy plan, and then we prepare. Then we will prepare to communicate this with all parties. Um, we will share this out with um, Vernon Hill Saga and LHS GSA. We also will provide training to our LST teams. Um, in uh, August during um, Institute Day, we hope to um, provide training to D128. Um, and then last but not least, update our websites, including resources. And then as a team, um, just really talk about the accessibility and the communication and how we can get better to make sure that this is known by all. Um, before I open um, this up for questions and discussions, Mr. Gore, do you have anything that you would like to add? Very much. All right. With that being said, um, do you have any questions? Or uh, in the previous comments. slide, just I, I'm not sure what finalize the advocacy form means. What mm -hmm. is that? So um, the advocacy form is something that we discuss. It is a form that um, initially when we talked about it would be given to um, our students to um, identify like what their pronouns are, what their preferred name would be and what supports. As the team started talking about that, we expanded that to include a form that will now um, not only cover those areas, but then also can be given to all of our students um, to identify those who may um, be in need of mental um, health supports or may need some social emotional supports and um, students that may um, have some financial um, deficits and that may need help on trips or um, different things within the school. So it would be more general to yes. um, provide a wide range Absolutely. of supports. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, on the same slide, again, this is really good work. So good job, everyone. Uh, the question I have was, it says, finalize the gender support plan. So is the idea here that the student has their own individualized student support plan and whatever documents that go with it? Is that how I should end up with that? Yes. So one of the components of the model is actually a gender support plan in which um, the students will work with a gender support team, which, are, which, is, which will be members of their LST and then an adult um, who they may have a very close connection with that they want to have there in the me meeting to support them. Um, and in this plan, it is very specific to their needs to support them within the built within all areas of the building. So if within the classroom, within the lunchroom, um, doing extracurricular activities, as well as during after school events, such as, um, homecoming or driver's ed or, you know, any areas that we may have not thought of, including um, overnight trips as well, too. Thank you. And when will this process be finalized? So we uh, will continue working on the plan and the company documents. The other document, um, in addition to the advocacy plan, is an overview of what the gender support teams should look like, expectations, 
Um, and then it's some guidance in regards to how to set up those meetings, what should be discussed. Um, so my plan is to um, finalize this with our social workers that were on the team, just haven't had time to do that yet. And then I anticipate this being completed and done by April. Yeah, our intention is for this to be ready to go for 23-24. Super. Um, does, the, does the advocacy form also serve as like a referral piece? Yes. Okay. So yes. I, I guess that was kind of my, that leads to my next question. It, it may be just unclear from the presentation, but maybe you just have the info. So I guess, how do students and families seek support other than coming to their LST and social worker? How do they initiate these kind of supports? Like for students who are encountering this perhaps for the first time, as they set foot into our doors of our schools, um, you know, I guess, how does this plan support the growth of that awareness of services available for families and individual students? Can you speak to that? Yes. Thanks. So with the advocacy forum, um, we are in discussion about um, how this advocacy forum can be provided to all students at the beginning of the year. Um, and it'll be a Google form um, that will, uh, where the students will ask certain questions and then based on their answers, it would just direct them to the next question. So if a student is not in need of um, supports um, because they're um, part of the LGBTQ plus or gender affirming, then it will um, skip them to mental health and supports or skip them to financial. Um, and then we plan to take this and then um, there are some questions um, on the form that if they are in need of supports, then it will funnel to um, a counselor or a member of the LST, um, and then we'll be able to provide information to the LSTs as well as, if needed, um, to um, the students' teachers as well, too. So is this like a something that happens during registration? Is it... So we're, we're talking about whether we should do it in registration, whether we should um, give the form within the first couple of weeks of school. So that's one of the details that we still have yet to um, decide on, um, on what's best. And is it something that goes out to individual students or does it go to families? It goes to the students. Yeah, it'll go to the students. Okay, other questions, comments? A lot of tremendous work, just uh, there's so much going into this. And um, I would comment, it says finalize the gender support model. I would I would say, yes, we'll finalize it as it is now. Yeah. This will be an ongoing process. There'll yes. be so much more that we find out as we go through this journey. And as you've already, you know, uncovered new new things as we go. So I'm, I'm excited that we're on the journey and we're keeping a focus on it so that we do recognize those things as we move forward. So thank you for we your work. We plan on um, providing, a, I mean, doing an update to this model every two years. So really trying to create a structure to do so. But thank you so much to each and every one of you for this time to present this. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is I think what a number of folks are interested in hearing about the uh, language lab update. So, yes. So the uh, language lab at LHS was discontinued at the end of the 2021 school year. Um, then it was decided that the Vernon Hills language lab would be discontinued at the end of the 2022-2023 school year. Um, so that is the recommendation that we are uh, presenting or will be presenting. Um, I. I wasn't here when the decision was made, so I don't have uh, a lot of the background information on that. I'm, I'm told our district historian, Mr. Brian Kelly, will have more of that information. Um, when we, um, just a little bit of history too, in 1920 um, was when we finished the school year um, under COVID. Um, so we came back in the fall of 2020. We were remote at that time. Um, and so we did not um, have the language lab at that time. And both of our language lab um, personnel were um, assigned in other areas at that time. Now, a little history of the language lab going back before that. 
um, was that we had language labs, um, and this is some of the information I got from um, our schools, um, using, uh, different software. Over time, obviously, that software has developed and changed. Um, we went from the computers to iPads, um, and then the um, College Board in spring of 2021. So now we came back to school in 20 to 21. Um, and if you remember in 20, all of our students at that point were one on one with Chromebooks. We had Chromebooks, the College Board had developed some um, a DAC Chromebook app, uh, Chromebook app, which um, we, you know, manage with our IT. Um, when we had our discussions in that spring of 21, so um, the decision was made that we were going to um, shift away from using our language labs. And Libertyville was ready to make that decision much sooner. Um, they didn't have the language lab in 20, uh, 2020, 21, and they wanted to re reutilize that space as an innovation space um, for all of our staff. So they were ready to make that decision going into the 21-22 school year um, and made that decision much sooner. Um, and Vernon Hills at that time said that they would be transitioning into um, phasing out the language lab, that they were not ready though for the 20, for that 21-22 um, school year and that they would um, phase that out in, Fast forward to, you know, this year is when we're looking at, you know, phasing the language lab out for next year. So I just have a basic question and a naive question. What exactly is happening currently in the Brennan Hills language lab in terms of how, you know, how do students access yeah. that and what happens? I can talk about that. I, okay. I first want to make sure that I say in public that our language teachers make really meaningful use out of the lab. There, there's no doubt about that. The, the, the language lab is used primarily for teachers to drop in. So there's a, there's a room that stays open. Uh, there's an ESP member who staffs it uh, five days a week, eight periods a day. Uh, and uh, teachers sign up for sections, and almost every one of our language lab teachers uses it. Uh, the students come in, and based on the teacher's goals for the lesson, they have worked with uh, the ESP member, Radhika Yoshi, who's uh, fantastic at what she does. She's highly skilled. Um, she's got the interface set up at the front of the classroom. The teachers move in. They sit at individual workstations. Uh, most of the time, they put on uh, headphones with also microphones. And then they go through a series of exercises, sometimes listening and responding. Uh, sometimes those responses are recorded. Sometimes they are literally speaking with another student, maybe across the room or somewhere in the vicinity that they don't necessarily know uh, or isn't necessarily sitting right next to. Those can be recorded. Um, the teachers then have the ability to go back uh, and uh, assess the student's ability to both understand, comprehend, and speak the language. Uh, and so I think instructionally, what I, what I think these teachers are here probably to say is there's, there's value in that. And uh, as a principal, I've never said there isn't. I don't think anyone has said there isn't value with that. Uh, I think uh, over time, you know, our language lab uh, continues to be used and I can't speak for Liberty's, but Libertyville's, but there is, there has over time become this, this uh, imbalance in programs. And so Vernon Hills is spending X amount of dollars every few years to upgrade the computers, every few years to upgrade the software. There's of course, user agreements uh, with the software uh, and, and we employ an ESP member to run that thing. Um, yeah, that, I think that answers the question of, of what the lab is used for. I think the question then becomes, so now all of these students that we have have one-on-one -on -one devices, one-to-one -one devices, right? They all carry Chromebooks. And as I talked to even Angie about this, um, it, 
for a teacher to facilitate that in a classroom, uh, the answer, the, it can happen, but it's going to be different. Right now, the ESP member at the front of the room is controlling the action, right, is pressing a button and every student hears the exact same prompt at the exact same time. Uh, the students don't have to worry about navigating that in their software or trying to you know, mess with their Chromebooks to try to get it. Um, obviously, the privacy of the, the classroom with the stalls, you can't necessarily replicate that in a, in a classroom. So there are some differences, but I think what I have challenged uh, Tammy Black over the years, because to Brian's point, I have, we have gone to bat and supported this language lab for several years, knowing that probably there was gonna be, uh, you know, a, a shift in that. Uh, but we've been encouraging our, our leaders in that language area for years to, to try to find a different technology that might be able to be used with the Chromebooks, since every student has a Chromebook. Uh, and I know that Jenny Getch and Tammy Black continue to work on that. I don't, that won't probably be free. There'll probably be some cost to the software uh, package just for, for that on a Chromebook. I don't think that's you know, there, there might be a subscription, uh, but but that still has yet to come. But in, in fairness to Bryant, we were told last year, and I did tell Tammy Black, that this is probably going to be the last year for the language lab. And so uh, she has known that. And um, I, you know, I, I, I think the teachers are probably here to say we would love to keep it. Um, but we we do understand that we were told that last year and then moved ahead accordingly. So. And. I don't know who can speak to this, but what is LHS doing? Because they've, I'm assuming, successfully phased it out. So what did LHS replace it with? Mm -hmm. I don't know. John, I don't expect you to be able to speak yeah, to that. I, I, no, that wouldn't be your... Yeah, I don't have that. No. So I don't... Oh. Whoever can answer the question, absolutely. Yeah, could you go to the uh, podium, though? Because we have people who are listening um, to the live stream. And if you're not uh, speaking in the microphone, they won't be able to hear what you're saying. Yes. So I was not at LHS when they, they didn't phase it out. So in the letter that I wrote to the board, I explained that LHS decided the teachers weren't part of the decision, but somebody at LHS decided to switch to an iPad model, where I think the vision of the space was that it was a collaborative space where students could work on, um, one group could work on interpersonal <laughs> speaking and I don't know, it was supposed to be a collaborative space. So they changed, they got rid of their old model of the lab and put in an iPad model and the software wasn't, it didn't work. I don't, you know, I think that they lost their lab aid, the teachers weren't trained in how to use it. It just simply, didn't work. And I think that teachers stopped going to the lab and the iPads were taken out. So does that, I don't know if anybody, if that sounds like that's the accurate rendition of what happened. So the teachers didn't decide they didn't need the lab. They, it just was taken away from them and iPads were put in, in the place. So that's why it's extra difficult for us at Vernon Hills to know Oh, LHS like is using the materials that they have in the classroom and that's fine. It's really not the same at all. And I don't think that, I think that many of the teachers from LHS would say, we want our old lab back this, you know, we didn't choose the iPad. I, and... I, I don't want, I'm certainly not going to argue that point, but without having yeah. that actual information, yeah, I understand. I, I, I'm not diminishing your credibility whatsoever, but yeah, no, speaking speaking for LHS or for the LHS teachers is yeah. probably not the best way for us to get That's that information. True. I don't know if any of them sent any letters or information to no, you. No, but Yesenia, Dr. Sanchez did speak about this with We're, Ray and, who, and Jenny. And Jenny, so I'd like maybe her to give an update okay. of a recent conversation with both of them. Yeah, so I, I think there's um, difference in opinions on on. on whether the, the lab at LHS is successful or not. Um, I can certainly um, prepare something for our next meeting just to detail that out. Um, but I do think that um, if you were to ask them, they'll tell you that the, the, the software on the iPads they feel is, is, is working for them and, and their teachers are, are um, starting to, to use the in the classrooms. Um, so I don't want to overemphasize 
the success of the LHS lab in having made this decision because as I understand it, there's there's we, there are no iPads there anymore. It's gone. No. Un understood. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess my my point is that we're not looking to re um, reexamine the decision because we've already approved a budget for next year that doesn't include the lab. So we're not saying go back and get more information so that we can make that decision over again because we've already approved that budget and cool. that's that's done mainly through the department and the building correct correct yeah i'm saying we can get some clarity so that we can support the model transition at vernon hills so you're saying what did lhs find that was helpful or it would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. Do that kind of an audit and then make sure we provide that and anything else. So Vernon Hills teachers feel supported in the transition. Correct. Yeah, and how because I, I mean ultimately, and I, I'm only speaking for myself, so please speak up. Ultimately, the board wants to approve whatever is going to be the successful model. So we're we're not passing judgment on what we want to approve and what we don't want to approve as as a as a board level budgetary decision. I guess what we do is we we approve the final budget, but all of the decisions made at the granular class level, department level, building level, um, th those are made before those things get to the board. But we do want assurances that the students are being supported. If we've taken one service away, correct. how are we supporting them going forward? And is that effective? That is something we want to know. Mm -hmm. um, however, you choose to provide that information, because I, right now I'm not comfortable that that is what's happening. So, Sure. So I can work with Joe and Ray and, and prepare with, uh, a proposal. Yeah, and I, I would <laughs> echo that. And, and uh, from a perspective, if there's something that we've overlooked along this process and, and remembering that a lot of these decisions were made in a pretty chaotic time and <clears throat> have been, you know, delayed and, and you know, the implementation of those decisions uh, hasn't been done, uh, has been done in, in sort of an, um, a prolonged uh, manner. So we don't have at our fingertips the reasons and uh, the decision-making you know, all the data that went into the original decision, but to to ensure the one thing that we can do is moving forward uh, to ensure that those students are going to have appropriate supports. And if it's to look at what's happening at LHS and learn from that, or if it's something else, I, I think we just need to be comfortable that as we make this transition and we make this change that, uh, that the There's learning. going to be some positive outcomes. Yeah, yeah and, the, and, the and the learning that's happening at Libertyville using, you know, the Chromebook app that, you know, the, the you know, Jenny can work with Tammy and can put things in place and Joe and Ray work together to ensure that the transition from, you know, moving from a language lab to not having the language lab that our teachers can be supported um, in that process. Yeah, I, I think I mean, we're the bottom line is, I think but, we're sitting in a position to have the benefit of seeing what has been successful versus can it be successful. Mm -hmm. So prior to making anything final, I would, if they were given those services and those opportunities, how, again, it would be important to see how LHS has transitioned from that mm -hmm. to the same level of success that they had with the language lab. Right. It, it seems, seems like they were ready to make that transition, so they should be able to speak to that. Right. And whatever is going to serve, serve, serve student learning right. best is what we'd like to make sure is implemented. And if there's costs associated with that, then we'll have that conversation. Can I ask just a, a background question? I know Brian went into it a little bit, but um, what was the original, I guess, logic behind just getting rid of the physical labs. I, I understand iPads or Chromebooks kind of came became available. I think maybe the usefulness of a physical lab became kind of obsolete with the pandemic. And it sounds like LHS kind of shifted models successfully. But I, I guess what I'm asking is 
you know, what was the initial driver? Were the language labs cost prohibitive? Were they space prohibitive? I think there was a combination, you know, in talking to, you know, the building that the way it was situated with the, um, um, what they looked at the time was the corrals that were, were set up, um, that, you know, the, the corrals kind of isolated the students. Um, we did have software, um, you know, in the labs. We had um, hardware that we had a uh, you know update, but it really um, the functionality of the room too by opening it up, um, it allowed other classes, so not just language classes, to be able to use spaces you know in in, in the school, um, and they just felt that over time with the change in some of the software, so the software went from um a sans lab sony soloist software to the ipad software to the chromebook software that i think just with the technology changes over the years that they were able to still um do some of the things that they were able to do and then can i ask another question kind of as a follow-up do we know of any of the just maybe yes any i can speak to this i don't know how much information exists without having a member of the uh World Languages Department from LHS here, but what are the current limitations on that iPad software or Chromebook software, or what have you, that don't match the functionality of the current language that set up? I think that that's something that we'll we'll have to get from LHS. I I am a languages teacher at LHS. Yeah. So I don't know if you have any questions specifically for me, but I can answer questions that you have. If you could shed light on that, I think that would just paint a picture and I don't want to speak for the board, but for me, um, you know, when we're comparing the original lab setup with desktop computers, study carols, et cetera, versus an iPad model um, or a Chromebook model with this newer software, what are the limitations of that software you've noticed as a world languages teacher? How has that either um, added value or detracted value from your experiences with a language lab, be it, <laughs> be it in the lab physically or within your own classroom? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, so I can give my opinion if that's, Perfect. If that's what you're interested in. Um, we really did enjoy the old model with the carols because that gave the best recording and it gave the best experience for the student talking, not hearing the person next to them. Um, it isn't the best for having a conversation, um, but that's what we do in the classroom. So the reason that we would go to the lab would be to do these recordings. And that was the best quality recording that we could get. So once we had the iPads, we no longer had the carols and we no longer had that advantage of that recording. And I'm sorry to get down to the nuts and bolts here of this. I'm just really trying to put myself in the place of a student and a teacher, but um, headphones recording yes. with a mic, right? Mm -hmm. Are those typically student provided, so, school provided? Yeah, the students had that too, but then we no longer had control over the iPad, so we couldn't start the recording at the same time. So um, although we ask our students to please be logged in at the same time and to start at the same time, that doesn't always, it's not as easy as it is when you're in the lab and you can, you can control that. Yeah, that in sense? practice, not, not necessarily a good use of time or instruction. Right, and we no longer have the iPad, so now we're, we're just using the Chromebooks the right Chromebooks. now. And uh, we don't we don't really have an app that's on there. We use mostly uh, a, a service called Flipgrid, and um, that doesn't work all that well all of the time. I've asked um, my students for feedback on that, and I the last time I asked them, uh, ninety percent of them said they had problems with it sometimes or all of the time. <laughs> so, I'm hearing that perhaps the software in place currently is not maybe the best fit for our teachers and students. Uh, it is not working as well as the lab used to work. By your, yeah. Okay. By your measure from your vantage. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then my other question, again, kind of goes back to the headphone piece, because I'm just thinking what, what with all the new technology we have available with noise cancellation and things like that is, are there other options perhaps we haven't explored that could potentially allow for better recording, less interference? We do have some headphones that are available for the students that we have purchased, um, but they are, I, I don't know how high quality they are. They're, 
they they are working when when the sites are working. May I just make a statement? Uh, uh, <laughs> to me, it sounds like there's maybe some optionality that hasn't been considered some cooperative or collaborative solutions that may exist that haven't been explored here, a third way, if you will. And I I appreciate I appreciate the language lab as a graduate of this district. I think I was one of the <laughs> experimental guinea pig classes for the language lab and I found it invaluable as an AP student studying Spanish. But um and I, I get it, like it is what maybe we are used to and perhaps what works best over at Vernon Hills right now, in the opinion of some of our teachers. But if there is a way, uh, this third way, perhaps, that we haven't quite conceived of that still allows the functionality and capability with our technology, but somehow frees up space, somehow preserves um, perhaps an educator who can provide that functionality at a level maybe our language teachers don't have the capacity to provide, right? Um, maybe there there is a creative solution that lies therein, and so I, I want to hear more. I to me this isn't very black and white. Actually, this this appears to be kind of a gray situation, very much so to me. So thank you for providing that information. Yes, Anio, what I would be looking for as we're going forward with this is looking at activities, skills, opportunities between these two models that are either available and no longer available. <clears throat> and if they are still available, how are they being implemented differently? I mean, we're getting into kind of programmatic stuff that is not really our, that's not our thing. Yeah. And I, that's... And, and, right. and, and I think and, so. I'm, I would rather look at more of the full picture and the broad spo the broad picture of are we offering those same opportunities because that's our job to make yeah, sure. To, to be fair, still... I don't think we will be making any change. Big curricular decision making. Kind. That's not our role. Not our lane. Think. But I think it is important for us to be informed as to what what's you know. What all the you know the detail, not specific details, but enough of the details to feel comfortable that we're moving in the right direction, and to be able to provide. I think you know I keep coming back to these decisions were made based on data that was available at the time. Uh, you know I I see a lot of different things. I've seen a lot. You know, and I, I don't want this to be taken the wrong way either. But <clears throat> I've seen a lot of labs set up around desktop computers and stations and things that just don't exist anymore. I'm not saying that they aren't valuable and that they might not be the right thing for this, but uh, there's technology changes and this is a technology-based lab. And if there's something that, you know, somebody can learn from and, and move on, it's not our job to make that choice. It's not our job to find those technologies, but it's, our job to listen and try to support uh, initiatives that might come out of this. So uh, I guess, you know, I'm encouraging um, the, the administration of, at both buildings just to, to take a step back and see if there's some things that we can do to, to make this uh, a better situation and learn from what we've done so far. And I hope I wasn't getting too into the weeds with that commentary, I just, I guess I'm not completely satisfied with what the current status of the language lab is based on that testimony we just heard at LHS either. That doesn't sound ideal. So are we trading down by eliminating the, like, what, do you do you know what I'm saying? It doesn't seem like we got. Well, I think it would be really important to have Jenny Getch and Ray Alvin here to talk about the rationale behind the decision and all the supports that are in place. Um, I don't think we knew the conversation was going to go in this direction, but they will definitely be present at the next conversation. Great. Thank so you. we have time to make some decisions mm -hmm. here. Um, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, I to, definitely. I just want to give some information. I'm Liz Sierra at VHHS. I teach AP Spanish. I just want to give you a little bit of information about the doc app that was referenced to. Um, so this app is on the Chromebooks. 
um, it is in English and it just basically it's an opportunity for the kids to record a sentence. There's no feedback provided. The kids don't speak to anyone in that reference. So it's just a test for the kids to practice what the test will be like um, in a 30 second recording. So it's just, uh, how would I say, a tool to see if they're ready to practice pressing a button on their computer. So there's not much educational value in that application. It was just a way that Doc and the AP College Board um, created to test the kids during COVID, from my understanding as an AP teacher. So just to present that info. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I definitely feel like that we are on the dance floor. We are not in the balcony. So I would like to move away from that. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to go about doing it, but I still have not, I'm not satisfied with an answer about how the decision was made. It doesn't seem like anybody in this room was a part of that decision-making process, whether it's the administration or the teachers. So right. we should have an idea. I definitely think we have people in the room who were a part of those decisions. I think that when we're doing staffing and things like that, there are many decisions being made at the same time. And I think it would go to the improvement we've seen in record keeping, the kind of information that Bryant is sending to you now about these staffing decisions and why we're up and why we're down in areas. We're doing an excellent job of documenting the why, the what, and the how. I think during the pandemic, some of those same things weren't happening. And sure. it was just... This was a decision. I think that I don't want to imply that there weren't very sound instructional things because I think um, Jenny Getch is stellar at her job. And so until we have her voice in the room, I want to make sure that we're not assuming it was just money. I, I don't think that was the case right. at all. I think we saw that students could be successful without the lab and that we might be able to use other technologies in its place. But I'd wanna wait for us. It doesn't mean at this table, but we will definitely have that voice for all of you. So you feel comfortable that high quality instruction is being delivered to all students. That's, that is, that's, 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 that is your job. Right. Yeah. I, I would like to add though, that I am a firm believer that the curriculum experts in the building are the teachers in the classroom. And the teachers in the classroom are the ones who will make the decisions about how to teach whatever it is. My experience is with science, so I can speak to that. It's much better to have your own lab room than a shared lab space. But sometimes budgetary constraints make it so that you have to share a lab space. It's not ideal. I can't speak from a curriculum point whether this space is better, but if I have a majority of teacher teams saying that this is a thing that is valuable to them, then I think that the administration would listen to that. And then it would come to us to say, yes, we're going to approve that expense. But we would not get into the discussion about what's best there. That's We're not experts there. Teachers are the experts. So I appreciate that we've heard from teachers tonight. I just think that we kind of got behind this, like, this conversation should have happened before somewhere else. And that what should have happened here was like cashing the check saying, this yes, is this is what yeah. we need. We agree with you. And right now I don't agree with the recommendation to get rid of the language lab, but I, I also don't feel like I have compelling evidence one way or another. I would turn that over to the teachers and their directors to figure that out and then come to us. We have a teacher. Um, so, am I allowed to speak? Yes. Um, my name is Radhika Joshi, and I'm the one in the Vernon Hills uh, Language Lab. I know we are comparing uh, Libertyville teachers versus Vernon Hills teachers. I can speak to a couple of teachers who are commuters who are at Libertyville and who come to Vernon Hills. And those teachers, even though they don't have that opportunity to use the lab here, they come to the lab every single week. So they see a value in using the lab versus whatever model they have on their laptops. Can you explain, how does an LHS teacher use the lab at Vernon Hills High School? They, they, uh, no. The commuting they teachers. Teach they teach in both buildings. I see. We have a couple. Yes. Understood, thank you. Yeah. So 
that's what I want to add um, that even for those teachers, it adds them one extra prep because they have to prep a class that they are teaching at Libertyville differently than how they would do the lab at Vernon Hills. They choose to add extra prep versus not using the lab. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, I, again, just a, uh, I'm sorry, just to Don's point that it's all helpful information, but we're not going to be the folks to make those detailed dis decisions. We're going to be expecting, you know, others to be involved in that and or have been involved in that. We just haven't had the opportunity to, to gather all the information. So I think it's, um, while we're grateful for people to be here and, and share that information, that's a lot more information than I've had when I walked in the, tonight, um, you know, this will be an ongoing conversation and, and we're not going to be making those specific decisions about how to implement or what to implement or, or those kinds of things. Uh, the only thing I want to add is I agree with everyone here. This doesn't seem like enough information for us to say this is the right thing to do or not. Um, but I just wanted to share what I heard. It sounds like there is a technology challenge. There is a space challenge. From my point of view as a board member, if I had to approve something, it would be something that comes up for budget and making sure that our students are ultimately served. So whatever recommendation all of you come back with, I'd like to look at if your example of the recommendation is to take away a lab, then what due diligence has been done to make sure that you have the same or better service when you look at technology, space, and all those things? And if the answer is, I couldn't find something that gives us, our, our kids, the same experience when you look at software, hardware, space, you know, what do you want them to achieve? Then, then we shouldn't be making that change. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to see that assessment and at, at the risk of opening a closed decision, I'd like to see that also being done for LHS. I mean, just because we made a decision before, if it's not working, I think we, we need to look at that. That's, that's all I wanted to add on top of everything else here. Anybody else have a, a comment? I suspect we're going to have much more conversation on this. Maybe just to add the link to other conversations we're going to have tonight about one of the things that is in the port board purview is to help us understand more clearly what we mean by equitable programs at both buildings, mm -hmm. because this is an example of that. Mm -hmm. And both when we're adding things or we're reducing technology access, how do how can we fully implement what we said we believed in our uh, equity policy about all students having equal access from classroom to classroom as well as school to school. And I see this as being something that wasn't fully considered at that time since it's been different for two years. So yeah, good point. Okay. Uh, shall we move on to the next agenda item? It's our uh, grading and assessment update. Thank you. So I have with me um, Mr. Uh, Dr. John Gilliam and Ms. Sam Phillips, who are part of the committee. We've uh, started working on this in the fall. We've um, all uh, all the committee members uh, participated in a virtual um, grading and assessment um, conference, a two-day conference where we uh, learned from experts such as Tom Gusky, um, Rick Gormley, Ken O'Connor, um, and we've met a number of times. And um, in the process, we've um, looked at what other districts are doing. We've looked at the shifts that were made, mostly to equidistant grading scales or to proficiency scales or elimination of the zeros. Um, and as we were doing our research, we found that um, all of the experts suggest or recommend that we start with um, really taking a deep dive into our, our grading beliefs and, and developing a purpose as to what grading is in the district and identifying those guiding principles. And so that's that's the point where the committee is at now. We've identified a purpose, um, and at the next meeting, we hope to um, solidify those guiding principles. So tonight, um, we are here to ask for um, um, 
clarity around what the expectations for the policy um, for the spring. Um, we do plan to have, like I said, the purpose, the guiding principles, and um, a number of recommendations to provide more consistency in grading. Uh, but we do know that this is, um, is going to require a significant paradigm shift in how each of us feels and, and um, about grading and assessment. An assessment. It's something that is um, very personal to a lot of people, and um, we are going to have to facilitate this uh, shift um, well. Anything you guys would like to add? I do. I this is one. Okay. Um, I just think, yeah, some additional clarity around what you guys are looking for in a policy and what you would like to see be consistent and at what level. Um, because the conversations we've been having, uh, a lot of the time we're talking about different content areas, different courses. We're we're looking at the difference between you know freshman literature and AP literature, right? And so the different assessment practices in those courses are going to necessitate different grading practices in different ways. And so um, just understanding what you're looking for as far as consistency would be helpful as we move forward in solidifying these beliefs. Thank you for joining us. And hi, Sam. Hi. Welcome to the table. I, oh my gosh, this is, it's a big uh, <laughs> Well, Sam is doing this as part of her internship. She is working on her administrative license. So this is excellent experience for her. Yes, it really is. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll just make a quick comment, putting my educator hat on maybe for a little bit in terms of policy. So we're wanting to develop a policy. So there's a board policy, but there's also, I think we need to be very careful at what comes to the board policy level versus what's maybe an administrative procedure so that we have the, the proper flexibility. So you don't have to come to the board to make adjustments to procedural uh, decisions that that you know it gives us all the the flexibility to do that because the board policy is really a a very high level sort of philosophical document if you will so that's from my perspective and and having worked with policies for a, a lot of years it's it's helpful to sort of put that lens on what gets in the actual policy versus what gets in more of an administrative procedure. I understand what the committee is seeking because there are different levels of specificity of grading and assessment policies from district to district. And so that was one of the things that I know they did look at and having seen other schools who are trying to tackle this and, and not only get consistency, but consistency and fair and equitable grading. So both of those things, not just consistency of things that maybe aren't contributing to improve student learning, um, but different policies, uh, Mundelein this last summer approved a comprehensive grading and assessment policy at the board level, and it, it was big picture about philosophy, about what, what we're assessing, what would count as evidence, what kind of consistency they wanted, and then the AR went into all the details about numbers or, or whatever might have been some of the things, but um, I know Stevenson also did some grading and assessment work in the last few years on their policy. Again, it's going from the policy being clear on expectations to then the implementation. And so I really appreciate uh, the committee asking how broad or how refined do you think would be helpful for you? Because we are, as we received a few emails in the last few weeks about parents requesting us to have more guidelines on fair and equitable grading because they are experiencing very different grading practices even within the same class, let alone the message they might be receiving from a first period teacher who says, I don't have to grade homework, that homework is just practice. And then they go to their second period class where they said homework is really important. And the parents are saying, is homework important or is homework not important? And not that there's one right way, but I would want us to have a consistent way of talking about that. And I think that's what I'm hoping the committee can help find. But we want to make sure that when we when we looked at the policy last time and it really only talks about that grades will be given, it doesn't say really anything else. 
So I think the policy as written right now is very sparse. So what would you feel would be a good next step so that we went from sparse to more clarity so that individual teachers, departments, and buildings can make sure that their practices are aligned to that? See, and we thought we weren't going to talk policy tonight. <laughs> That's right. We were wrong. Um, so the policy that we're referring to is 628, which is extremely vague. It's, it's like, yeah, we'll give grades. Yeah. And it's about it. Um, uh, and we do that. We do that. <laughs> and we do that. Yeah. I, I, again, I'll just reiterate that, you know, to try to keep it the board policy level of it high and philosophical, but yet, you know, with enough framework to really guide the work that goes on underneath without restricting unnecessarily restricting and having to come back and revisit it over and over. I would personally, I would be curious to see um, some of the, the other policies that have, you, know, you mentioned Mundelein. You, there's some other ones out there. I'm sure others are struggling with this. I know a lot of, especially high schools are, are struggling with this, um, trying to get this right. So I, I appreciate the, the effort. This is really, really, really challenging work. And um, uh, so I think it's, it, asking the right question, make sure we get it encapsulated in, in policy in the best way we can. And do we address that at all in the student handbook? There, Yeah, there is a section in the student handbook, but I wouldn't say it's much more descriptive than uh, board policy. It sort of just outlines the percentages, what they mean, and then sort of the letter grades during progress reports, and then the letter grades um, for the final semester grade in that shift from the plus minus to just the whole letter grade. So it doesn't it doesn't go far beyond that. I see. It's helpful to know what you know what yeah. we have in place in terms of policy and in the handbook. It's more about the management of grades mm -hmm. and okay. less about any kind of philosophy. Mm -hmm. I, I think just Got to it. add, there's a couple dynamics at play. One, when we get a committee together, as we have of a, a pretty wide range of stakeholders from science teachers to language teachers to physical welfare teachers. Like they they all see grades differently. And and we quickly realize that we get into the weeds when we start talking about behavior, for example. Like, should you grade behavior? Well, that's pretty easy to tell a math teacher not to grade on behavior because what behaviors are present. But when you talk about a physical welfare class, when running daily to get your heart rate up is that's a behavior. A, that's a skill. <laughs> getting the heart the heart rate up. That is, yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, Sam has an example in her uh, journalism class with teamwork, right? Like they have an editor and a group working together to develop stories and, and uh, a news magazine. And, and so those teachers begin to talk about the nuances of behavior, skill or behavior, and what can I assess and what can't. A math teacher might say, well, Homework is a kid's practice, and we practice in class, but if they don't finish the practice, then can't I expect them to practice it? Those kinds of things. So we quickly get into the weeds, uh, and just so you know, we started pretty early talking about the zeros and equidistant scales, um, which we can share a little bit more if you want, but, um, and as Yasinia's um, um, memo states, we realize that like first we got to lay a foundation of uh, of of kind of our philosophy of what grading is and that's what we're working on and, and and we feel good about that but what we don't feel good about is once we identify some principles is that going to be okay i've i've heard lisa talk a little bit about kind of taking what we're doing here and bringing it down to here um and we want to we want to be true to that but just looking for a little bit more guidance of what does here mean for you so that we don't we don't do this and you're like no we wanted it here or you say oh we thought you were going to be here um uh, so I don't know I mean I can only speak for myself I'm not interested in telling teachers I'm not qualified to tell teachers how to evaluate homework in their class um you know I don't want to get to that level of detail. I was thinking more along consistency between departments, making sure that all the math teachers were on the same page with how they handled things and all the history teachers are on the same page with how they handled things. 
than I was trying to get into the weeds in specifics. I personally am not looking for that. I can't speak for my, my co-board members, but I, I think Jim put it best when we definitely want to make sure our teachers retain autonomy in, in how they they grade because that's their skill. That's what we are, you know, that's why we have the awesome teachers we have because they know how to do that. And if I could just jump in and speak to at a department level, that consistency, that even gets challenging. I teach three different preps right now and I have three different grading practice policies in my syllabi because of the different classes I teach. So I teach AP research where students are working on a year long process. And so I, my grading policy is either you demonstrate mastery or it's incomplete. I require them to redo because everything that they're doing along the way is contributing to that final project, right? Any other class that would be appropriate because that's not the model we're following. So to have a department level directive of how I need to grade, um, looking for that kind of consistency would be challenging just based on the, the variety of students and classes I teach in a single day. Okay, that's good feedback. So is it really policy? that we need to look at and maybe review other policies that are clearer before we give some direction? Because mm -hmm. I, I do agree, I think we need to stay at the policy level and let the right. experts you know, handle the details. Um, so is, is that where the conversation needs to start at, at the policy level for us to um, make ours better? I, yeah, I think it would be helpful to see some examples and maybe, you know, maybe, We'll find one that, no, we'll do something just like that. Maybe we'll create something out of a number of them. But I think whatever we decide, it will be an example of the level of detail and the level of information that we can then bring back to this committee and say, okay, what's missing? Or maybe they see this as a piece of their overall picture and the rest of that picture needs to go in an administrative procedure or something, some other, you know, uh, type of documentation or the student handbook or whatever that might be. But I think it's, yeah, it it doesn't hurt to to borrow from others and and learn what what others have been doing. Yeah. In the same. I think I keep coming back to our example of our the difference between our protocols and what our beliefs were. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into the protocols because that's not where we are. Uh, but I do want to have an eye to, I know we are preparing our students for any number of different paths that they choose to go, but many of our students choose to go to the next level in academia and any policy we have should be reflective of what are they expected to see at this next level and are we preparing them for that? So I think we are, that is where I want to keep my mm -hmm. eye for those students that do choose to move on, have we prepared them for what it's going to look like at the next level? And, and I, I don't see continuity as I don't, I don't see consistency and continuity as being identical because that takes away from the autonomy of what's going on in our classroom. And our teachers have done that, so I don't think we need to have consistency where it's identical. And I don't want to be in that process because I'm not working here every day. I want to keep up here with the goal of preparing our students for the next level if that's what they choose to do. Yeah, so we have to figure out how we're gonna answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you would appreciate some models, not necessarily for the content, but to say, here's one broader policy. Here's a Goldilocks one, or here's a pretty detailed one, because the, the, we want the members of the committee to be offering the content. I think I'm hearing like what, what do you feel is broad enough to have teacher, uh, the art and science of teaching be accounted for, but specific enough that as parents challenge us on some of the ways they're saying it shouldn't matter if I get you or you for a teacher, I should know that my students work will be assessed in a very equitable way. That's what we're trying to find is that sweet spot. I have sort of that take a step back question is, what I thought this discussion was going to be versus what it is, is, is slightly different. So my question is gonna be, what is the ultimate goal or deliverable, if you will, that will come out of this committee? Is it 
a board policy? Is it a board policy and your working protocol? Um, or it's only the working protocol? What's the actual outcome or what's the mm -hmm. end product of this? Because I got lost well, I'll, after this started. From what I know, and yeah. I appreciate Bryant, our historian, um, but during COVID, it required us to shift many of the grading practices that we had. And some of them were required by the state. We had no choice. And some of them were options that we said we needed to do because it was so remote and so challenging. So there was a committee that got together, Rita oversaw that committee that tried to make some grading, it wasn't a policy, probably some protocols, consistent grading protocols so student learning could be measured in an equitable way during the pandemic. When we came back from the pandemic, we had this list of protocols. And last year, Rita was working with the team to try and say, okay, makeups, we had them required um, before. Um, you know, some of these things about um, some of the other grading practices, are they, are, is our pandemic language gonna continue? Is it not? When we looked to the policy, we saw that our policy is very, very, thin in terms of giving guidance as to policy-wide. So we started this committee last spring, actually, and we said that was way too fast. We needed to slow down. And so we invited a lot more teachers to participate. So they have been meeting. I think what we're realizing now is we still haven't decided what is the product that would best serve all of our needs. I, I think I'll, I'll try to take a crack at answering your specific question, and that is, this is a process that's going on, this grading practice, um, you know, the, the committee, the, this work is being done, and what's being asked from us is to help support that work and the future outcomes of that work with a policy that more specifically addresses the work that they will complete in the in the, the philosophies that that will come out of that. So I think you know our policy right now is so vague it just doesn't it really doesn't do much of anything. So I think it's important that once all that hard work is done and all those frameworks are developed or however we deploy that that we should have a strong policy that supports that in a way that really, you know, gives it um, our blessing and our our support for for the work that they're doing. Um, so I, I think it's a it it's a lot of different things, but the conversation here, and I think what we're being asked for is how far do we go? You know, we, we have a very vague policy now. What is our expectation of how deep do we go, and how how much do we put? within our policy. And I think it's, you know, I think it'll be an evolving process. I don't think that we could come up, there's no way we can come up with a policy without really understanding what's gonna be supported by that policy. But um, it's, I also think that it's helpful to start looking at um, opportunities to, to, to learn from others and what they've done. Uh, I will make one additional comment in here. It says Where? the committee was in, in the document for this section in this letter. Yes, in his memo. Yeah, in the memo. Uh, it, it mentions uh, that the committee met to, to finalize a purpose statement. So when it's June, appropriate to see June. that, that will be very helpful because that purpose statement, in my mind, would be one of those things that really needs to be in the policy. So it's that type of thing that that should be outlined in the policy to support the work that's done in the district. And, and one of the things, um, as schools say that they have a grading policy, they really don't have a grading policy. A lot of people use the term policy, but even if you look at Mundelein, they have a grading policy, but it's not a policy. They have the same policy that we have in terms of grading. They call it a grading policy, but it's really their procedures that are in place which include the grading scale, which include, you know, some philosophy uh, and so forth. So, you know, when you start looking at schools, is it really a policy that was developed and adopted by the Board of Education or is it a policy 
a policy, I'll use quotes, that is really a procedure and guidelines that were developed by teachers and administration that is in place. And, you know, the one thing, yes, we made changes from that we were forced through the pandemic, but we never changed our board policy. We changed our procedures that were, you know, went with it. And then we adapted our procedures or the way we graded after the pandemic and continuing to look at that. So if you change your board policy, that's, you know, set in stone and that's what your guidelines are. That's what you have to do. And you can't, it's harder to make, you know, adaptations. The other thing is we have put an equity policy into place, which references, you know, some things with grading and assessment. So we have to make sure that we are being, you know, equitable in our grading and assessment practices and that it also ties into our, our equity policy. But that piece of the equity policy is pretty vague too. It really doesn't define what that is. It doesn't say what you know equitable grading practices are. But. So Brian, you brought up the equity and I was kind of thinking the same thing. This is very similar to creating a policy. And although I wasn't a part of the process, I don't think the equity policy came from the start of the board coming down. It was a part of the committee coming up and then the board kind of approved the policy. So I, I guess my question is, is it so, I mean, how is this process so much different than that process that it can't come as a recommendation from the committee of what you want to see the policy look like as opposed to us doing the work and it never works when it's the top down telling you, what, I mean, I, I don't think so. So Thank isn't you. it much yeah. more... Uh, buy-in when it comes from the bottom up so what is the barrier between of you coming to us with something that you've worked on and i'll just add that cara just said everything i was trying to say more eloquently <laughs> Sorry. because i've been struggling with what comes first you know us telling you go do this or you saying here is the best practice support us with your policy that's kind of what i've been I've read this memo a hundred times and I can't figure out which direction is the best direction. Yeah, I, th I think we're we're all sort of saying the same thing. I, the, the work, the, the actual practices, the actual way we do things is going to come from the committee. And my, you know, comment earlier was once we understand that we need to be able to develop a policy collectively that supports that work. The work. Yeah. Not describes that work, not dictates that work, but supports that work in, in, in the proper way. And I think really, I don't know, I'm, maybe I'm putting words into your mouth. Um, what the question is, is how deep do, do we expect that policy to get? Because some of our policies get Right. Far more detailed we have than very others. Very detailed policies and, our, and very vague policies. Yeah, and our yeah, and this one is just like there's no <laughs> there there. So, I I think it's a good question, but I agree. I think it's the the actual work's going to be done within the policy. We're not here to decide right. how to do grading and how what gets assessed and what doesn't get assessed and how those. And I was involved on the equity policy um, development team. Mm -hmm. And um, it was exactly as you described. It came from the committee. The, the work came from, the recommendations was, uh, came from the committee. There was a lot of parent voice on that committee. Sure. And so that might be something else that we consider um, for this policy, because right now it's very skilled teachers who are serving on that committee. But <clears throat> I think that's one thing that set the equity policy committee apart is that there were students and parents also sitting there and they were some of the people who drove the commitment language and the metrics language. And so I think that might be one other thing for the committee to consider. Well, and uh, just to jump in and clarify, I, I think the reason that, at least the reason I'm here today asking some of these questions about what the board is, is asking is because from my perspective and maybe I'm, I'm misinformed, what was told to me was the board wants a policy. Right. So that's what I'm responding to is the board wants a policy. So I'm trying to say, OK, like what what are we looking for here? Because I have teachers that are fearing a top down policy and I'm sort of I feel like I'm the one walking the line here trying to make sure. So the words have been used to me several times. The board wants a policy. So I'm trying to figure out what the board is. looking. Thank for. you for saying that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank I, you. Uh, 
I don't know that we've ever had a conversation where we said we need a policy. I, I don't yeah, remember that don't conversation. Remember I think yeah. we want a framework. A, a I think we want to become idea. more aware of a framework, um, a, an educator generated framework, what works best for our educators and our students first and foremost. So um, the committee was formed, did you say, or were you given a directive? Yes. Or, okay, what was that directive? To develop a policy that was going to provide more equitable and fair and consistent grading. Okay. I think we need to be careful, careful with the term policy what, yeah. Yeah. based on what Brian was just saying, because when we use the word developing policy, is not a policy, a board policy is a very high level document. The, the, the what versus policy. the how, right? Yeah. Right. So I think that's where we're kind of like, we need clarity. It's like, cause we can, I think we can develop a policy with the, with the purpose, just with the research we've done around what the, what we believe as a district, a grade represents and those guiding principles. Like here are the things that are going to guide how we grade and how we, um, Think about grading, um, and then I think when we're we're talking about everything else, those are administrative procedures. So I I think that we can do a policy. I think the administrative procedures are what will take more time, um, and we will need um, I do think more and more input from hopefully some some uh, families and some students. It's just that we thought that you wanted all of it now. No, no, yeah, and I would, I would say, and I think you've heard, we don't want to dictate what this looks like. We need your feedback, and we don't, and actually, if there's a chicken and the egg scenario here, the, the, you really, we really need that, the, the, the content of what we're deciding to do before we can even create a policy, because that policy has to support what we're doing. It's not the policy dictating. We don't want the policy to dictate because we don't want to make those decisions. It's got to come from the other direction. And I think the analogy of the, the equity plan was was a good one. I So to answer that question, unless somebody else has a, a you know, a, a serious um, um, desire to do something different, I think we're interested in the work that the committee's doing and the results of that. And it will be, <laughs> I'm living this myself, it'll be messy, it'll be complicated, it'll be, it might not be finished for a long time, but it'll be finished in steps. It, you'll, we'll have certain things that we're able to implement and get, get going. And at some point in time, then we'll be able to step back and say, you know, based on this, uh, the, 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 the statement that we're talking about and sort of the philosophical work that, guided the work you're doing, then we'll be able to step back and say, okay, this is a policy that we feel, this is how we're going to change our policy. We already have a policy. Um, and in reality, it supports what we do, but it just doesn't do it very well. So once we get a little deeper into that and we understand where this committee and where the, the district is going from a, from a grassroots perspective, then I think we can develop a policy to support that. An organic development. That's yeah. I just want to clarify because it, the the message has been, you know, there's outside community pressure that we need to formulate some well, there, sort of. There well, is. I was just sure. going to speak to that. Okay, and if you don't mind, um, I, I don't know how it's going for the rest of you, but this is what I'm hearing like literally every day. My phone and my email are blowing up over this. So I'm getting a lot of external pressure from my constituents on deliverables sooner than later. And so I understand like haste makes waste. We don't want to do this in a in an you know unthoughtful or rushed way. We risk a lot by doing it that way. However, um it sounds to me that there is some urgency within the community about getting this on a path to resolve. Um, and I, I want to make the point that if we are honoring our equity policies, that time is of the essence. And to me, this seems like one of the, the top priorities for our district is, is figuring this out um, for, for me personally. And just like putting on my educator hat for a moment, this is 
this would help me as an educator. Um, and I, I'm again, only speaking for me as an educator, I would feel empowered by this and not that my autonomy was being taken. Um, so for me, I, I would really truly appreciate kind of a map of where we're going with our itinerary and steps along the way. And then perhaps even some kind of loose timeline because lately this is becoming a major conversation in the community and and we we sit in places of governance i feel indebted to answer the community and to add to what kara was saying this was one of the top strategic plan items too and maybe i'm wondering if that's where you got it from that you had to build the board asked to build a policy i'm just guessing here but I think the problem to be solved is to have better, different, I don't know, put the adjective of choice, creating practices that are equitable and maybe as a parent or a student more, more predictable to know if I'm in this class and if I do this, here's how the grading will be versus it being different from class one to class two. That's the ultimate problem we're trying to solve. And we don't want to be the ones. We don't want to tell you how to do it Correct. because Correct. we. And how, what do I know about grading? And the and the the pedagogy that serves learning is is what you're going to tell us about. We're we're not going to try to determine that. And just to reiterate, like at a high level, it sounds like that kind of philosophical piece would be would be very possible. Definitely, what we're on track to accomplish this year of like the the purpose statement for creating the set of beliefs that can govern our practices, but even from a perspective of like what happens in a math classroom versus what happens in an English classroom, like doing the same thing from class to class doesn't necessarily serve the learning from content area to content area. Yeah, yeah. that so makes that's sense. Not that's where, like, yeah, you're not going to get anybody here. Okay, because pushing if you want back on that. to do the same thing that my friends no. are doing in the math hallway. Um, you know, it's two different learning processes. So a kid is going to go. And, from and, and I haven't class. heard any expectation on the okay. part of parents who've expressed concern okay. that they expect the math grading policy to be the same as the English grading policy. Okay. But I do think we have some differing practices and that's what's for the same things. Yeah. And, and students, our student school board reps are a perfect example of the student yeah. voice that has come to us saying, we don't know what to expect we feel like there's such different expectations of our friends that are taking the same class but have a different teacher and that's where um, the concern is um at least from the community that that uh, that i've heard at lunch that, today that was that was like a highlight of our conversation the kids were focused on that <laughs> yes iman was there and so was larry and i think they can attest that came up pretty uh with a pretty substantial yeah, but we don't expect it. us or students or parents to say what is the best pedagogy, what 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 serves learning the best. That's where you're the experts. But there is a, I think keeping timeline and in, in mind is probably important. I mean, I'd like to see some kind of a roadmap long term. However, it is there might be some low-hanging fruit that you know is easy to accomplish doesn't have a negative impact can we implement that I'm just throwing it out there don't go exactly but can that be done in the next school year a you, start somewhere right start something somewhere but then maybe you have more complex areas that you start sort of think about pilots you know do you pilot by school do you pilot by department and you could go so many different ways but having some some timeline that we can all sort of look at even by the end of this school year, I think hope you guys can can come up to that. So the family starting next school year has something to look look at. Yeah, I think this is good. This, this, expectation. Is, this is very helpful. So I'm hearing really, I think three things. One, a timeline. Two, just to give you an update on where we are with kind of a purpose slash philosophy. Three, you one. I, I think I heard you say you wouldn't mind seeing some examples of what some schools are doing yep. relative to yep. Yep. Po policy. Uh, but then I've got a lot of nuggets that you've shared in terms of, you know, everything from um, not throwing away my autonomy policy versus 
procedure framework that doesn't restrict. Those kinds of little nuggets are good for us as we start looking at uh, what our practices might be underneath a, a broader policy. So I, I think we have- Can I give you one more nugget? Yeah. I would hope that teacher teams have similar identical yeah, grade So books. that's that's a great piece of this equity, right? And yeah. we've heard that several times that student A who gets the, you know, teacher B has right. a totally different experience than student C with teacher D, right? It just- We um, call it the twin effect. The mm -hmm. twin effect. Parent yeah, has right. twins. Yes. Two yeah. different classes, two different classrooms, but the same course. Same course, different experience. Completely different expectations. I got it. I would also like to add with a view to the future, with the view to the next level. Our teachers are in the best position to know what our kids are expected as far as grading to the next level. And it needs to look similar. So by next level, that's if they choose second college, they yeah. choose, you know, you know, whatever. What does it look like? Well, we, and can can I add that? It should be a logical progression. Our freshmen should right. not be on a grading system that a college professor should use, but there should be a progression towards if you're a freshman and this is what grading looks like, it's going to, there'll be an iterative process getting to a senior who, whether or not they go on to post-secondary studies are, are being evaluated the way that the expectation will change when they leave us. So when you wrote clarity. I looked at that and tried to think, well, what you're going to be the experts that are examining this. What, what am I going to give you as clarity? Now I do have some background. So um, as a group, I would hope that what you're doing is examining good grading practice. And then you're looking at what the peer reviewed modern best practices and comparing that to what it is that we're doing, looking for discrepancies. If we're doing exactly what best practices, we can be like, good job, and we can move on. And if we find discrepancies, then we would come up with a plan for improving whatever it is our grading practice is. Now, on several occasions, you said this, this would require a significant paradigm shift. I don't know what this is. Sorry. So is this, uh, we're all going to go to standards-based grading. That would be a paradigm mm -hmm. shift. That would be a mind blower and it would take us a little while. Although Gusky would say that top-down would be the best way to do it. We just implement it, <laughs> yeah. get it done in one year and move on. That's, that's the only way to do yeah. that. Because <laughs> like, like I said, like to have a stakeholder group of all the... You're never going to come to that consensus point. Right. So, so right. if that's what this is, I'm not ready for that. And I don't think we are ready for that. Mm -hmm. I think, again, and I think we've said it several times, you are the experts. Find out what needs to be done. Being responsive to the community. Um, as Ms. Benjamin brought up, uh, I think that that you're on the right track. But as far as I'm concerned, I didn't come here tonight with a specified idea of what I expected you to tell us. Yeah. So, and I think we just wanted clarity on a policy that includes purpose and beliefs, or you want a detailed policy like the equity one that has metrics and when they're going to be delivered and all those things. I would right. say at this point, don't worry about the policy. Do the work that you're doing, the good work that you're doing, and come up with those components, procedures. the procedures, the, the, the frameworks, the whatever you need to do, we will then step back and say, what policy can we craft to support that? Okay. It's, it's you know, it's... You move know, away I'm, from I'm, the we, word we, policy. Yeah, you yeah. move away from the word policy. Yeah, I wouldn't standard. worry about what's that the frame, What's the procedure? Um, what, what, with your expertise, because that's what we're depending on. And I don't want to develop... High-level policy... Yeah, I don't want no, to develop a policy that restricts you. So if we, right. if you were to tell me, we'd really like it. If we con had a consensus, we really need a new policy and we got to do it now. It wouldn't be that much different than what we have. It wouldn't right. be that much deeper because I would be afraid of. Be the tail wagging the dog. Yeah, yeah, uh, of, of cons constricting what capability we might have. So I wouldn't worry about policy right now. We're not pushing policy when people say we want a grading policy. 
it, that's not a board policy. What they're really saying is we want a, a better grading practice. Okay. We want better, yeah. you know, we want to improve that. Yeah, framework, whatever you want to call that. So I wouldn't get hung up on the policy part. That's that'll come later. Can I just offer maybe just some historical context? So I, I wasn't really involved with these conversations, but I was kind of next to them a little bit. And just for history, I think if you use the equity policy, the racial equity policy as an example, I think a lot of that came from a lot of people in our district and it grew over years of people saying, there's something missing here. There's something that's not quite right. And they were working on it and then basically ended up coming to the conclusion that we need more, we need more oomph here, but it's going to take more than just a grassroots thing. And so, but the strongest thing that the organization can do and the board of education that leads the organization is to set a policy. That's the biggest thing you can do in this district. You can't create laws, but the policies are your laws, essentially. Um, now, policy can be scary, but policy is nothing more than the will of the board. Sometimes your will has to be what the state says your will has to be. But other times you have more flexibility. But in your flexibility, you can exert your will. I think when that equity, when the racial equity policy was developed, um, there was this uh, a balance of grassroots coming up and saying, we as a system, um, Sometimes policy does restrict, but it's intentional. It's right. purpose. It's meant to be yeah. purposeful. That yet, yeah, you no, know, you you have. We want you to focus in this area, and so I think similarly, the 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 what I've seen from the grading practices was under the umbrella of equity, equitable grading practices. That's the thing that I heard for years uh, being talked about and talking about that, recognizing that there's something going on with grading. That doesn't seem quite right. We need to figure it out, get to the bottom of it. And it's, I think it's very logical that somewhere along the way, somebody thought, you know what? We, we have people that think this is important. The strongest thing the board can do is do it by policy. And so I think that was an, I think that's a natural logical connection that the strongest thing you can do is set a policy um, that will, you know, the idea is to help improve and change the system. And so there's only so much you can do building that up and getting everybody to buy in um, at some point to make system changes, it requires a policy change. And sometimes we get that a lot of time at the state level. They will craft a law that was not on our, that's, we had no interest in changing that, but we're then forced to. And so that just to some historical context that I think. No, that, I think that's, that's a really good point. Good that's perspective, a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a really good perspective. And I'm, I'm thinking, I was thinking of this process as you were speaking <clears throat> and really once you know, we're going to to get to a point where we've begun formulating our practices and our procedures and our framework of how we're going to do this with a, a good portion of uh, of our overall organization. But at some point in time, yes, we will need the policy to say, okay, this is the direction we're going. Um, and to sort of validate that that direction. And I think we will we will get there. I don't want that policy to be the driver of that, just like it was on the equity. It's a, like you build this to a certain point, and then to get it pushed even further, we have to sort of, you know, uh, formalize that through policy to say this, yes, we agree. We as a board agree that this is the direction we need to go to. So, but I, for I, the equity policy, we didn't write the policy until we had stakeholder input. Right. And it sounds like we're in the early stages of that with the administration and the teachers. Um, but we we crafted the policy further along in the process that we than we are right now. Although I think you make a very good point about the strongest thing that we can do is create policy. I'm just not hearing that we're ready to to do that right now. Because yeah, we don't have the framework. We have our support to keep going. Yeah. 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 Go for go, it. Go, go, go. Yeah. Do your work. Thank we you. appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else on that? Yeah, thank you for your work. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> Was it everything you imagined? Oh. I should have had anything. <laughs> yeah, I watched from Zoom, so higher on live. Okay. Okay, we're getting on. Um, next up, uh, school calendar update. Yes, so we met with the calendar committee. I know, I don't remember who was that asked for an update. Um, 
in response to the, the, the volley request. So we met with the calendar committee. Um, Casey was there, Larry um, facilitated. We invited our feeder districts. Uh, we did have um, Super, uh, Dr. Hannigan from um, seven, 73, right? He's from 73. The other uh, three districts couldn't be present. And so we looked at um, what districts around us have moved to secular, uh, which ones are still uh, observing religious holidays. Um, and then we polled everybody in the room um, and the majority, 19 of folks in the room um, would like to keep a uh, religious calendar. Um, and there was, a, was it four, Larry? Four. Four folks that uh, um, supported a move to secular. And so this is just an update as to where we are with the committee. I think we, we still will have to meet with the committee, reconvene them, um, and I'm saying, okay, if if we are going to continue with the, the religious calendar, what are the uh, criteria? What is the threshold? How do we determine what you know holiday or any day will then be um, in, in our calendar? Will will be honored and observed in our in our calendar? So that is uh, something that we will have to uh, follow up on and and do that with the committee. Um, and that's uh, going to be challenging because they're. Yes. There will be unintended consequences of develop, developing that policy. Yes. One other thing that um, in looking at the information considered by the calendar committee, it was for the next year or two where several of the religious holidays fall on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So once you go three or four years That's out, it will make our school year much, much longer. So My understanding of, well, first of all, let me just say, Thank you to Mr. Vern and Dr. Sanchez for the great work they do on this. Uh, after sitting on the calendar committee for 10 years, I can unequivocally say it is a huge challenge to put this together um, and make it effective for all the stakeholders. Uh, so I appreciate that time. Um, we, My understanding with the meeting was that we were looking at the 24-25 calendar when we said, do we want to stick with religious calendar versus secular calendar? Um, then saying we were going to put a objective way of looking at how we approach our calendar going forward. We need to have some way to make these decisions for the time when it comes that all religious holidays fall on school days. We're going to have to have an objective framework to look at some of this um, as groups come to us and, and ask us to help them um, with their religious observations. Um, keeping in mind, this is one thing that I can't state strongly enough. We will always support our students taking an excused absence to celebrate their religion and observe their religious beliefs. Th that is always available to our students. Yes, you may have work that you have to make up, um, you know, when you come back, but we would never restrict anyone from um, observing their religious beliefs. Um, but I, I definitely, I think in the wording of the memo, we may be a little premature saying that we don't see a trend of other schools um, in terms of how they observe their calendars, because we, what we didn't really look at was when did the schools that went to secular calendars, when did they do that? We don't have that data. So if we could maybe gather some of that data, they may that may help us really understand whether there's a trend out there. Because if the list of schools that are, are on secular calendars have switched to them in the last three years, then that is a trend. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something to consider. Yeah, so we will we will do that. Um, um, Larry and I will... We'll, we'll email districts or call them up or read board minutes and, and all that to figure that out. I appreciate that. Is it more likely that secular calendars have just been in place for all time so far at many of these schools? I really can't say. I can tell you that where I came from, it was a secular calendar when I got there. Um, and But I, I couldn't tell you when that change happened or if if it happened or that's why we need the information. I know, Dan, you were 
working at Lincolnshire when they made the change. So I think at different communities, it, it's come up at different times. And it, I think it comes up more um, when you get into different um, different pockets that have different religious, prominent religious groups in their <laughs> districts that, you know, have different things. Some of these communities, you know, I grew up in Zion. There was it was mostly like Christian, you know what I mean? So that matched up really well with the days off, right? So for that, a lot of that community. And so the communities end up being differently. And then particularly as those communities have shifted over the decades, that I think has prompted a ton of conversation. That's exactly what happened in Lincolnshire was the community shifted and it was different now. And it's, now it's, what do you do? And that's, you know, that's what that district uh, went through that process and made their decision at that point. So. So just an update, um, a comprehensive update of what the was done. Um, so we met as a calendar committee, and it included um, students from our various faith-based faith affinity groups um, to look at what we are currently observing as our holidays. As we all know, we currently observe a religious holiday, and I defined the religious holiday based on including Jewish holiday observances. So these schools um, were schools that did that as well. 128 is the only school that I was able to find that has a non-attendance day that aligns with Eid of schools in Illinois. Uh, we also looked at our feeder schools uh, to determine family for families who have students in both 128 and in our elementary districts to see how our calendars align and there's an even split between our four feeder schools. Uh, and so the calendar committee came together with one objective, one outcome for this particular meeting, and that was to determine whether we wanted to continue to observe a faith-based calendar or to consider a secular calendar. We did not look at the 2023, 2024 school year calendar because that calendar had already been approved and published and based on our, where we are in, in time, we felt that it would be um, appropriate to, uh, to reserve those dates as, as they currently stand. Um, also, um, based on the idea that this discussion came from a presentation about Diwali, and in the 2023-2024 school year does fall on a weekend and would not be impacted by this particular school year. So for those reasons, we were intentional about not looking at 2023, 2024. The second calendar that has been approved by the board was the 2024, 2025 school year calendar, which is the calendar that we did look at. It is also published on our website. When the committee looked at this calendar, we met under certain constraints um, for examples that we looked at. It is important that we reiterate that these were examples or samples. Um, it could be changed or manipulated in any way, but the constraints that um, were used in order to create these samples were maintaining the same start and end date for students and staff and maintaining the same total number of days uh, for students and staff. We have yet to adopt any calendars beyond 2024, 2025. Um, and so those are still um, open. When we looked at our secular options, <clears throat> based on what we currently have already approved, they would be removing Rosh Hashanah and Good Friday and Eid would be the three uh, religious holidays that would be removed. When we looked at our faith-based calendars, we looked at continuing to observe Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Good Friday, Eid, and, the, and considering adding Diwali um, for that year. That's the uh, poll that was taken from the stakeholders. Some of the feedback that was um, discussed in that meeting included uh, the appreciation that our Muslim students felt for the addition of Eid in the school calendar, um, and also what students um, who presented the presentation for Diwali would feel if there was to be a change in the calendar, 
they felt like they it could be perceived as a retribution for their presentation. Um, and so we took a poll of all those present that included the members of the calendar and those who are not members of the calendar committee in attendance. So it was all in attendance for that. Um, and that is the 19 to four vote that Yesenia referenced to continue to observe that holiday. Um, with that being said, the discussion felt that it supported our daring mission, that a religious holiday supports uh, our tenets of being aware, um, ensuring that we seek to understand the varied experiences and realities of others, as well as our global tenant, that we value diversity. They also felt that it uh, supported the District 128 racial equity, diversity, and inclusion policy that ensures that D128 schools are identity affirming environments where all students, their families, and the community feel safe, welcomed, and valued. The committee reported out that observances of a religious calendar supports and reinforce, reinforces our core values as a district, which are embedded in our daring mission and racial diversity and inclusion policy. They felt that it was the fabric of who we are as a district, and that is a beautiful tapestry woven together by strands of various faiths, beliefs, and religions. It makes us better and stronger together. And so those were the comments from that particular meeting um, where they made that next steps. And again, so that meeting the outcome was to determine which would be supported by or recommended by that committee. Next steps, if that is accepted, is that we would collect faith-based demographic data to determine what religious holidays are observed by families uh, to establish the criteria then and thresholds of a district-wide holiday observance, and then to adopt operating procedures for adding district-wide religious observations to the school calendar. And we would use this identified curriculum to determine which holidays would be observed so that we would have a formal, objective, systematic, and standardized way of determining what holidays we observe as an organization. And that's for calendars from 25, 26, and beyond. 24, 25. 24, 25, we, yeah. we settled on. But for my, in my mind, it was from 20, so 25, 26 on, we will use the framework that we develop to evaluate any further religious holidays and whether the ones we're currently taking meet those criteria. Yeah, but I, so 23, 24 is next year. That's already been approved. Correct. And then the fall, we come back and relook at 24, 25, 25 calendar. But that was the one that we were discussing in that meeting. As exam he was giving examples of yeah. that one in the meeting yeah, so that I mean, people could see what it would look like if you did went to a secular calendar or you went to, you know, um, observing all the religious holidays. I think that the, the, that it, it's hard for, I think it was hard though for the committee just to look at that one year because there are examples like Dr. Herman said that, you know, a couple of the religious holidays fall on the weekend. If all of the religious holidays fall during the week, Plus, you have an election day um, and yeah. some of the other holidays. How do you fit that in when we want one of the things was to keep that start date on that Monday and keep the ending date, you know, on that Thursday before Memorial Day? How do you, you know, how you can do it? You know, you take four days off. You might have to switch, shift some of the other days that you take off. It might meet up. And, and I guess that's the thing yeah. that I don't think we fully considered. Correct. If, if, is it more important to keep the starting and end date or to have observance of religious holidays or having a two week long spring break or a winter break? You know, it, all of those things are competing interests for when we don't have school and when we do have school. And so I appreciate Casey, you saying that the committee felt good about the draft that we were able to arrive at. But even that, some of the drafts had the holidays on a teacher institute day and not on a day off, off. And that's a difference. And so how are we going to say which holidays go on Teacher Institute days? And they're usually fall when it's not really the most optimum time to have a Teacher Institute day. 
So I also, for pedagogical reasons, wouldn't want us to always think we have to have a religious holiday when uh, when we, excuse me, a teacher institute day that aligns with that. That's not necessarily setting our teachers and our administrators up for when their learning would be optimum in terms of um, getting prepared to implement something new or somewhere halfway through where we're doing a reinforcement, you know, whatever kind of learning that we need to do, I'm fearful that this plan could also be handcuffing us to putting <laughs> teacher institutes with um, religious holidays. And I think that's not necessarily aligned with best practice. The secular plan. The religious plan. No, the religious, the religious plan. plan. And you also slippery slope, man. I think uh, personally, I I'm in favor of honoring religious holidays and pushing out the school year. I say this as a religious minority. If we want to bring the holiday into question that I'm thinking of into question, we don't want to go there. That's silly. But like, that's a normal day for someone like me. I'll go to school. My kids will go to school. So I. Honoring our equity policy, it's... <laughs> well, since you said slippery slope, my question is by setting a qualitative, quantitative threshold, are we opening ourselves up to some legal scrutiny that we don't really wanna be opening ourselves up to? Yeah, because if it, it might imply that if you are minority enough, that your right. voice doesn't matter. And I don't think that's what we are trying to do here. So mm -mm. that's where the thresholds worry me a bit. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is if you start aligning teacher institute days with religious holidays, then what happens to those teachers who are observing that faith? You know, you're, you're making them work when they really shouldn't be. Right. So I think that doesn't sound and, and right currently right now, maybe to answer that question, there are um, some days that we are in school and that teachers um, have uh, th their religion and they um, need to take that day off and they are allowed to take um, days off for, you know, religious purposes. Obviously, again, it's difficult if that's your religion and you're not going to work as a teacher, you're doing prep work for your, you know, your religious day off. Um, and sometimes that's difficult because you're trying to also honor your religion and have a day off. Students, same thing, you know, they, uh, according to board policy and state of Illinois, they can take religious days off, but again, and, and, and not be penalized, yeah. but again, that's difficult. They're not in school. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a balancing act of, you know, how can we, you know, honor all of that. But I, I do recall when the student, I wasn't at the, uh, I think I was ill when the students made the presentation about Diwali, but when I watched the board thing, it was, yeah, we're in support of this, but make sure we have something for the next student group that comes and wants right. to present. Right. And so what I hear us saying is if it's not going to be quantitative data, what what might we use as some guidelines? How are we going to make those decisions? Right. I, I, I don't know. And I think that actually is what prompted many districts to go from a religious to a secular calendar is they didn't want to get in the role of saying this religion is more important than that religion. Um, so I, I think- my, my concern, yes. and I'm sorry to come back to this, my concern is that the, the secular calendar honors one religion over all others. That's, a, that's, that's why I struggle with it. No one is asked to give up the holiday that happens to fall during that two week break on the secular calendar. No one ever. Yeah, would the, the conversation be the same if that was two weeks in November? Right. That's my sticking point. Well, I mean, I understand that and I agree and I, I, I want to respect that. But the bottom line is those two weeks in December is because the entire country is not really working and going to school. And how would we be offering our services and vendors and everything else that needs to happen to have school go on when you don't have the access to those vendors? I get it completely, but principally, right? Yeah. Also, you got to recall, like some of the reasons those are days off is because it's a legal school holiday in the Illinois school code. So we don't have a choice, and I'm not I'm not disagreeing with you of why it was why it was called a legal school holiday, but it was, and you know it just has different it has different legal weight when 
the state says this is a this is a school holiday and I, other dates aren't. yeah i get it completely i'm just kind of devil's advocating right here this is this is what when you're of a minority faith this is what goes through your head every time if we don't establish a framework of how we make those decisions going forward, though, we are going to run into a legal issue in terms of we have to meet certain instructional minutes. For sure. Mm -hmm. And we are at a point where we don't have days to give. And it, it doesn't do our community any, any service to not be honest about how we're going to make these decisions going forward and put some kind of framework around it. Um, in, in trying to take some of the emotion out of it, we can find some ways to put metrics and and make those decisions because we we are going to have to to do that. I support a framework entirely. I guess what I'm saying is when it comes to Thursday before Memorial Day weekend, I don't see that as a hard cutoff for any particular reason. I don't see why that needs to be like right. something we stick to exclusively in the future going forward. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. And, you know, speaking from the perspective of excused absences, which are always available, but my kids have never taken them because they miss too much in school, right? And, and I bet that's what happens with many other students who would like to celebrate, but they don't because the impact of not doing that is too high. Um, so I think that's the other perspective. But yeah, I, I think if adding a day, adding two days to the calendar it makes it more equitable. But, but yeah, it's we need to have a framework. Now. I just caution on when we start looking at only 5% of students are, you know, whatever religion that, that could get into a bit. I mean, we have Ramadan, we have Kwanzaa. It's it's only two now. So how where is the cutoff? I mean, I'm gonna well, be the person. Yeah, and I don't I don't know what other metric you'd use. And I wonder if there isn't some precedent that is being used by the three, six, nine, ten other uh, peer districts that still have a religious calendar. Some of them are much bigger schools than us in areas with more diversity. So these metrics might have been established and there could be some precedent that had been used for the establishment of them. So um, like we always say, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. If there are other best practices in place that can guide how we develop a framework, then by all means, take a look at them. But we're not being asked to do anything to, I want to go back no, to- this is a conversation, is a an conversation. update from the committee and a conversation. So now we have ideas on some of the information we need to gather, and then what can be the focus for the committee's next meeting. Okay, any other comments? Okay, thanks for everybody's input on that. Uh, board self-evaluation. Yeah, so I uh, put this on the agenda in following up from conversations we had when we were writing our governance handbook. And one of the things that we put in our governance handbook was a goal to have an annual um, process by which we would, uh, as a board, as a governance team, the seven of you and one of me, um, reflect on how well we're aligning our practices to those governance um, principles. And then just any other things that we would want to say, are we using our time as effectively as possible? You know, just some of those things about meeting protocol versus the idea of um, are we, um, you know, um, uh, following some of the protocols about putting things on the agenda? I'm just thinking of some things that we added that were new protocols that we want to get some feedback on. Um, so now that we're sort of getting to the end of this school year, Lisa and I thought it would be appropriate to get some uh, direction. I don't mind contacting the person or finding the right tool, but I didn't want to do that without the forward, you know, like which, again, sort of which depth of, of self-evaluation would you be comfortable with? There's some that are very, very granular, and there's some that are big picture all from IASB or other other tools. So they're all very reputable. Um, I wanted to hear what the board had to say about that and how I can assist you. Some of those tools focus really on meeting effectiveness. Maybe as a group, we decide, no, I don't know that we need to adjust meeting effectiveness, or maybe we do. 
maybe we want to talk about how we affect how effective we are as a team or um, some other aspect of governance. But now would be the time for us to just sort of have a discussion about thoughts about how how we choose what we're going to evaluate and how do we want to evaluate it. This is perfect because I was going to bring it up. We we created this handbook with these mm -hmm. protocols and we've been doing it and working it for a year. I would love to come back and revisit mm -hmm. our protocols to see what's worked, what hasn't, yep. and how would we change? Yep. Because there are things to be a good board member. I have tried to faithfully follow our protocols. And there are times where I've thought, you know, I don't think we thought about this in practice. And I'd like mm -hmm. to revisit that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and we, just, we designed it with that in mind. So yeah. we definitely yeah. have the space. I'm not too sure we're going to get a, a nice, neat, efficient tool to be able to do that. But I think carving out some time towards the end of the year, um, just a review. We just go down and yeah, I don't need yeah, an online down tool. The list and I mean, see I, how it's I, working. If that you know, our first evaluation is based on this product. How has it worked for us? I I would be content with that. Yeah, I mean, we put there was a lot of work that went into that handbook, and it's a great tool. So let's let's continue to evaluate it and make sure that if there's a way to make it better, we do that. And and equally as importantly, make us better. Yeah. Right by reflecting on the tool and using it How for. We've been able to use it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The only other thought I had was um, that that's actually a great idea, but um, you know, the strategic plan is sort of what you know we've started going on. Should we like evaluate ourselves on how well are we supporting? <clears throat> The execution of that strategic plan. I think we should probably do that every year to make sure we are doing what we're supposed to to meet that objective. We'd have to develop a tool, right? Some kind of valuation tool. Yeah, some kind of rubric. Yep. Can someone remind me? Did, did we do this last year? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is our first, mm -hmm. our inaugural. Having no evaluation. experience with this. I'd be interested to see what tools the IASB has. Mm -hmm. Same. Okay. We can do that. Um, again, I think the idea of the local assessment we want to do is to our own governance handbook. But it sounds like we're also interested in a few of the things that just high functioning boards regularly reflect on from IASB. So um, I can definitely pull together a few of those strands and then have that prepared for some board feedback, um, probably at the April meeting. Okay, um, we're down to the um, future agenda items. Anyone have anything that they're interested in adding? Well, I did, agenda? but now I just brought it up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, has everyone, I don't know if this needs to be put on the agenda, but we will have to take a look at it by our next um, committee meeting, the student board rep interviews, selecting uh, the student board reps for next year uh, are coming up in April. And the buildings have graciously um, invited us to participate in those interviews. Um, so I would encourage if you haven't had a chance yet, please do look at that um, so, so that we can. I did look at it. And they are all during a work day. Yeah. And not any weekend opportunities. Is that possible or this is set in stone? Yes. So I don't want to speak for the buildings on that, but I think because we're dealing with students, we prefer to do it during the school day. Yes. Yeah, it's a fair question, but I, I think it's almost impossible because our kids are so overly involved, like to try to single out a Saturday in which all of our current board reps who are involved in six different things, plus the 12 kids from each school that it, there's just- I totally no, get it. Yeah. I, so I, I think totally, I and expect, I looked at it and I, you know, it's just not something that I think I can- And you're not the only one. It is an, an extra activity. Yeah. And when you took your oath of office that you have fulfilled very faithfully, it did not not include taking off time from your paid employment in order to do extra activities. So- that is a hundred percent acceptable and understandable. So I appreciate your your input on that, and I hope that you won't be uh, no. disappointed if we're not able to accommodate. Full faith. Excellent. Okay. Um, 
So by the next meeting, hopefully those of us that do have some flexibility with our work schedules. Um, what are you looking at me for? I'm not looking <laughs> at you. <laughs> You I'm are the here. only retired person on our board, but that's, you know, neither here nor there, but, but you also travel more than any of us. So <laughs> I can, I can take one of the days I was waiting to get, I, I can't do the second day. Uh, here's, so what, here's what, what I'll offer. The 26th. I'll raise you. <laughs> I was 26 years old. 26 I can't do and then there's one on the 20th I think Vernon Hills is on the 26th and LHS is on the 20th somewhere in there yes I can read my before. email I was gonna I was gonna offer to take LHS because I uh served in that role last year at Vernon Hills and I would love to see what the process is like at LHS Twentieth. so I yeah. could do the 20th but I can't do the 26th okay we can take it somewhat offline and figure it out, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I okay. just wanted to be sure that we knew that by our next committee meeting, we will have had to Some commitment. Um, decide who's participating. So cool. Anything else? Just a few agenda items. Um, I thought I saved my comments, but I can't get to it. <clears throat> Long day. Oh, no, I, I did. But we have a few ongoing activities it would be nice to get like an update like you did with the calendar i think i think you covered two so someone was reading my mind when they put the agenda together one was the grading uh second was calendar <clears throat> third is the community education i know we kind of stopped the program here but there was work going on to essentially find alternate ways of providing that service so i'd like to get some kind of a periodic update on that. Yes, I can give that in April. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then another one that was on my list was, I can't remember when, but there was some conversation about how do you handle programming for, I'm going to use the wrong words, but the remedial students, mm -hmm. am I using the right words? But it's the students who need help essentially are off in their own class. Mm -hmm. And there was some conversation about how do we, you know, uh, improve the experience for them. I'd like to kind of get an update on on that. Not right now, but I want to add some cadence to that. Yeah, I definitely included that in one of my updates to the board back in December when it's about some data and some information. And we've been talking about that um, at the December, January, February, and March meeting now at all admin to try and say, what does this mean here? What data do we need to look at? What are these outside um, laws and regulations saying? So I, I think we had we have a lot of consensus now on a way we can move forward. And so I'll be happy to present that at the April meeting. Is there a way that we could add just a list of these things and then can figure out what when we get periodic updates on them till till that is actually closed, if you will. Good idea. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll, else? I'll send an email if I remember more. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Uh, shall we adjourn programming personnel? We need a I, couple like minute, a five minute bio break, break yeah. you know, whatever. Let's yeah. do a five minute Let's do break. five minutes and then we'll be back. Hmm? 817, I should do it.
Plans, the uh, Facilities and Finance Committee meeting for Monday, March 13th. It started at 8.19. Um, let's start with uh, the invitation for public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to please approach the podium? And a reminder that we try to keep comments to uh, three minutes. Okay. This. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Great. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Wes Poland. I'm a District 128 resident residing in the Vernon Hills High School boundary. Before I begin, I want to thank the Board of Education for your dedication to our community and the students of District 128. I personally understand and appreciate your sacrifice to serve. Please accept my sincere thanks for advocating for our collective interests and in making the difficult decisions necessary to prioritize student success for all students at both Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School. I'm here tonight to comment on inequity in our district, specifically graduation venues. The graduation ceremony for Libertyville High School is held at the now arena in Hoffman Estates and students have access to unlimited tickets. The overall budget for this year's LHS graduation is $60,600 or $136.18 per student. The Vernon Hills High School graduation ceremony is held in the main gymnasium and the students receive four tickets. The overall budget for this year's graduation is $10,300 or $27.76 per student. When looking at the two high schools, the district plans to spend $108.42 more per student at LHS than on the Vernon Hills High School students. Vernon Hills High School families needing additional tickets to attend graduation have to reach out to families or create in search of posts on social media in hopes of securing one or possibly two extra tickets from families not using all four of their tickets. The big event hosted by the District 128 Foundation for Learning and the Vernon Hills High School Cougar Athletic Boosters Bash capitalize on the demand for the Vernon Hills High School graduation tickets. At both events, families have the opportunity to bid on extra graduation tickets. All this is just for a chance that siblings, grandparents, step parents, and special caregivers might be able to attend the milestone event in their student's life. When Vernon Hills High School opened its doors, graduation tickets were unlimited as new housing developments were completed and more people moved into the Vernon Hills boundary. Class sizes grew. Instead of securing a new graduation venue, to accommodate the growing class sizes. The solution was and continues to be to take away tickets. I understand that the current D128 projections show a slight decline in the student population over the next five years. However, this reduction will not solve the graduation venue inequity. This inequity will only be rectified when Vernon Hills High School students receive the same number of graduation tickets as the Libertyville High School students. I am not I wanna repeat, I am not suggesting that LHS students receive fewer tickets or switch to a smaller graduation venue. The students and families at Vernon Hills High School should have the same access to graduation tickets and a similar graduation experience. After an in-person meeting with Dr. Herman on February 22nd and watching the board meeting on February 27th, I know several inequities exist between Vernon Hills High School and Libertyville High School. Fortunately, the graduation venue inequity is fairly straightforward and an, and an excuse me, an uncomplicated one to remedy. The time to act is now as the classes of 2024 and 2025 are quite large. The class of 2024 is approximately 400 students, which is only 27 You're fewer students. You're about three minutes if you could wrap your comments up, I thank you. 27 fewer students than Libertyville class of 2024. Please do not waste valuable time conducting a survey. A survey isn't necessary to point out this apparent inequity. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to hearing about how the district plans to make the Vernon Hills High School graduation experience more equitable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment? Okay. Seeing none, we will move on to the discussion about graduation. Um, I'd like to take just a second to, to make a couple quick comments before we 
enter into the discussion and the presentation. Um, it's worth revisiting how we as a board operate. As a board, we employ the superintendent, we set policy and direction for the district. And as such, we empower our buildings to develop their own graduation plans. Typically, the board doesn't tell the buildings where to have their graduations. Um, I've been on the board since 2018, and I can tell you it has never even come to us where we have told Vernon Hills that they can't spend money on graduation. So I, I just want to make that clear as we enter into this. Um, you know, it's it's really never even been brought to us for approval. So it, it's worth noting that as we converse about this. So, any other comments, Denise? No, I just wanted to say it was following the meeting I had with the parent and then Kara um, also, I think I said parents um, request that the board have a conversation about this because I think uh, although it hasn't come to the board before, I think that now that people understand the difference in investment that the um, now that we're, now that the sunlight has hit this issue, it's mm -hmm. something that is um, not a, a tiny difference. It's a, a sizable difference in terms of the monetary amount. Um, and I think from many of the parents who contacted me, they just look at this as an opportunity to say, so what do we want it to be going forward? Um, and I think, um, again, this isn't necessarily because it is becoming such a large public um, uh, discussion. We definitely want to have your input on what you think would be wise. Again, you're representing the parents and the community and people like that. And this ceremony is for the students and their parents and the community. And so I think if ever you uh, you have an expertise, <laughs> this would be one of the ways that you participate in graduation and you understand the importance of it to so many families. Um, so I think that's why it's as a discussion item, it's been brought to our attention. Um, we will be developing uh, next year's budget. Um, and I think how we develop budgets, we sort of roll things over and we, we don't, zero things out every year to year and say, is this still a good investment? Um, so I don't think there's any intention that Libertyville tried to increase their budget spending and Vernon Hills was not. And I just think that we have traditions and we have ways of doing things and sometimes they grow further and further apart. And I think that's the situation where we find ourselves now. And so the parents are asking our whole organization to consider this and I think because it's such a sizable amount, you approve cut, you would you approve this contract. So you approve the contract for the now center. And so I think we wanted your input since it's a sizable monetary difference in, in what your thinking is about that. And then I and the administrative team can definitely do the work we're hired to do in terms of implementing some of those things. Well, I I just want to say this has not not heretofore been a financial decision. Um, the, the the way that we've arrived at the venue was not based on a monetary constraint. It was based on what the building designed. And because so much of the parent feedback has come to the board and not to the building, I counted as of tonight, 11 emails that the board received that the building was not included on. I'd really like to put it back to the building to say, do we want to examine this? And then if, if you come back to us and say, hey, we need to, we either need money or we need some other kind of support so that more tickets are available. I think that's then when we, when we jump in and when it's appropriate for us to, to set it. But in terms of the money, I mean, we're always open to if, the administration comes to us with a recommendation to spend money and we agree with it, we're going to approve it. And I can think of very few examples of where we have, we may have asked a lot of questions and we may have made some changes, but there haven't been examples of where the administration has come to us to approve a budgetary item and we've said no. So I, I, I think if the question is, are we open to considering the expense? I, 
of course we're open to considering the expense. And can I? I think you don't yes. know there's a problem until you know there's a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've only been on the board for now a year and a little bit. <laughs> Coming up on two years. Uh, so until you know it's a problem, you don't know it's a problem. And we've never heard that it was an issue. And I almost had, I don't mean to, I do question it being termed an inequity because we didn't know there was a problem. So I don't, when you say it's an equity, there it's inequity, there's almost a sense of a purposefulness and there was no purposefulness on this. I get that there was a lack of opportunity and it's not the same, but it was never presented as there being a problem with that. So now that we know there's a problem, if that is something that the building wants to change and come to us, I, I have no problem doing that. But I do have to say there are many Libertyville parents that I've also heard from that do not like going to yes. arena. And it becomes mm -hmm. a balancing of, mm -hmm. am I going to choose the inconvenience of the travel to have the uh, unlimited. unlimited tickets versus I can't tell you how many times I have been asked, why can we not just have this here? And when we did have it the one time with COVID, I understand the parameters, but there was so much positive feedback I hope you consider bringing graduation back. So I was a little bit surprised <laughs> yes. to see all of these emails come in because I didn't realize it was, I mean, that's ignorance on me because I've never asked. So now that we know there's a problem, I would absolutely be open if that is something that the building wants to do. So I'm at the other end of the spectrum and having been here a long time. <laughs> Um, At least you remember how many years. Far <laughs> it feels like a year. Years. Um, <laughs> to to, to, to the, the, the equitable, what I think in some cases we confuse equal to equitable. We're not trying to be the same. And when the decision originally was made, I believe it was an equitable decision. I believe it was a decision made at that point in time based on the information we had, based on the feedback we had, based on the community we had. Uh, at that point in time. I'll step back. I'm probably a pretty unique individual, at least with the people in this room, where I've had children go through these schools and I've attended graduation for my own, my own offspring at both. I had a LHS graduate. I had two BHS graduates. I've attended both of these venues. Um, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but I think if you talk to most high schools, they would say they would love to be able to have their graduation ceremony in their house, in their facility, if possible. That's not always possible. Um, and it's a typically a space constrained thing. So. As you were saying, Cara, you know that I I like both. I I have no preference Vernon Hills ceremony versus Libertyville. I've attended many of both, both as a parent and as a board member. The venue at the Now Arena, it's great, big, lots of technology. Although we have a lot of uh, technology that we bring as well. Uh, but it's a, a big, wide open. You can have as many tickets as you want. Um, but it is a long way to drive. It is somewhat impersonal because you're so far away. Um, I get, I'm sad because while the choir, the LHS choir can sing, the orchestra cannot perform. So you hear a canned, you know, uh, track where the, the, the students and, and staff uh, process and recess to. At Vernon Hills, it's home. Yes, it's very tight. You only have so many sick tickets, but the orchestra's back there playing. You hear our kids playing. It's in our house. It's it's a great, they're both great ceremonies. Um, you know, I, I like them both, but I can see that there's benefits uh, to, to, to either one. And really, the, the moving off campus was a necessity, not necessarily a decision made to go to a better venue. I'm sure, you know, if we had a venue here in this building that could handle that, 
you know, I, there would be a lot of argument to bring it back home. But um, again, it was, I think it was a decision, decision made at that time with, uh, you know, the best intentions. Does that mean that decisions should stay forever? I don't know. And that's not really our job to decide. It's up to the buildings. And I know John probably has some some comments here, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a historical perspective that, you know, neither one's better than the other. It's just different. It's and it's different based on decisions made at that point in time. And it's going to be impossible to make everybody happy either way. Um, with that being said, do you have any thoughts you want to share? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I know that. I don't mean to make light of it. I, it's interesting, you know, Car said, you don't know you have a problem until you know you have a problem. I, I feel the same way. I don't, I don't feel like there's a problem. I know I, I certainly listen to the comments and respect those comments for sure. Um, just, just a couple of things of clarity. One, we do offer unlimited tickets, but she's right. These last couple of years, we've only offered four, well, take COVID out, um, four in-person gymnasium tickets. But everybody else um, who wants to come uh, is welcome to sit in much more comfortable seats in the auditorium and watch the, the event um, streamed live. So I, I've had four kids graduate from the high school, and that's where my parents have sat. That I mean, that, that's that's just the way we've done it. I have been at every Vernon Hills High School graduation, every one of them. Every one of them has been in the gymnasium. So it, this is really just a matter of tradition, how we do it. I, you know, it's not, it, there was never discussions of, about um comparisons and to to Mr. Batson's point, like uh, Dr. Batson's point when, you know, I, I've also been in Libertyville graduations as a teacher at Libertyville and, and when we were uh, at um, Ravinia and they just have always had that that space crunch as to not be able to do it in their own gymnasium. And I don't want to speak for, for Dr. Kalensky, uh, Kalentes, but I, I know that there are inherently difficult things about moving a venue and inherently good things about the the, the decision they've made to move and and obviously the the big thing is tickets i will say this just from a school standpoint you know what i say to families is of course you have unlimited tickets yes you know the 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 extras um sit in the in the uh, auditorium and watch so there's that i also say that um, we do ask students to to turn in tickets uh, to us for those that if, if I know, you know, I only have my mom and dad are coming and that's the only two, then here's two tickets. And each year we get a, a handful. We're not getting hundreds back. I'll, I'll shoot straight there. I'm not saying that that's like the windfall of all tickets, but um, we do offer those back. Uh, I do know that there is kind of an act of, hey, kind of this network of does anybody have tickets the kids kind of do on their own um i will say this this is my favorite part of our graduation is that we flank the ends of our rows so if we have 15 rows of of graduates with an aisle down the middle on each half of that row i have two faculty marshals and the thing that's special about the Vernon Hills High School graduation is that our teaching staff is involved in graduation. They sit next to the kids um, and they celebrate with them. And as principal, that's that's a that's a huge thing for me. And um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say that I've uh, polled our teachers um, to see how many would make that difficult drive out to Schaumburg or Hoffman Estates or wherever that is to and but I, all I have to do is look at Libertyville's numbers to see that that would diminish greatly and to me that would be you know kind of the the greatest hit of that we we did we did plan an outdoor graduation because uh, that's been something that's been kicked around and you know my entire principal life, I've heard principals say, don't do it. Don't do it. Because you can't imagine the stress that goes into 
um, you know, watching the weather and wondering and wait, is that a cloud or is that what is that? And um, you know, the Thor guard going off and all of that stuff. So, but we did it. We did it once. We decided to do it. It was over COVID. It was 2021. And man, we spent, you know, $10,000 to get the DJ to set up extra speakers that we didn't have and rented the chairs. And wouldn't you know, it stormed that entire day. And so we got stuck back in school with kind of a, yeah, a makeshift split schedule. It was, and I vowed at that moment, I will never do this again. <laughs> so, um, you know, and of course, then Hawthorne literally graduated the next night on our field. It was like 70 in sunshine. It was gorgeous. <laughs> um, so you just roll the dice on that. I um, So I, you know, with all due respect to the, to the comments and the emails, like I get it. I would never try to dismiss that or tell somebody that that's a bad argument or um, your priorities are in the wrong place, I, whatever. I would never say that, but I would... I would point to the tradition of the high school, um, the way that we've made it work, the the really good feeling that, you know, I I I honestly can't I honestly can't remember uh, a parent coming up to me before, during, after graduation, and and complaining about it or um, you know questioning the decision. Um, not, and then maybe they are under their breath or whatever, you know, but, um, so I, yeah, so this idea of, you know, you don't have a problem until you have a problem. I still, from a school perspective, um, you know, don't feel like we have a problem. Lisa, you said pretty clearly, like you can't please everybody, not everybody's, if we move out to Hoffman, there will be people that are upset that we're doing that, you know, we've A, lost tradition, and B, you move the thing 20 miles away, and it's hard enough to get there on a Thursday night, um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's my voice at the ball. I really appreciate everything you had to say, John, and I think this, it goes back to our example about what's the role of a policy from our P&P meeting, because um, one of the things that the board charged all of us to do was to look for inequities, and I, I, I don't think inequities ever imply intention. I think they almost always are more unconscious. Um, but in the equity policy, it called for us to review any program and to seek these things out so that we could then, once we're aware, say, how do we want to proceed? And so I think you're going to be seeing things that we didn't even know were different. We're, they're going to surface and people are going to ask us, OK, now that you know about this inequity, now what's your action going to be? And I don't think we have a protocol established or John, or the parents, or other people who want us to reconsider doing something differently. It's, it's, we're treating every situation very differently. And I think that's normal when you're doing something new and for the first time. But I think it goes back to, we said we want this really loose grading policy and that we're gonna sort of take some of the individual things as they come. This is an example of taking individual differences as they come and how hard it is to do that. So it goes back to, again, what's that sweet spot of not having a policy or expectations that are so tight that it's dictating things ahead of time that we don't even know, but why would we have a policy saying review and see that there's differences and when we find them, we're not quite sure how to proceed. So I guess that's where I feel a little in uh, a gray area of wanting to be able to advise John on how to proceed once this, these things are surfaced. Um, because as someone who um, came from a blended family, I think sometimes we um, are used to our old structures serving a fairly traditional family structure with a nuclear family where four tickets would be pretty sufficient for most families. We have so many blended families, and that's what I was reading in many of the parents who brought this to our attention, that the needs of our families are changing, and that that's what they're asking us to reconsider. 
Um, and so to me, that's what I see this issue about. It is about what is going to, how do, how do parents or any group who feels that there's an inequity going to bring that to our attention so that we then have an opportunity to audit that or to say, is this still the right way to proceed? I don't know uh, if it's necessary to codify things to the minutia, such as graduation, but you know, more of this kind of holistic approach where you're looking at things situation by situation as they come up, could that that right there could be codified into some kind of policy. But as for, you know, just kind of the optics here, if graduation, if if upgrading, or I don't want to call it upgrading, if changing the graduation venue at Vernon Hills is not cost prohibitive, the optics are really poor. Um, and if you know anything kind of about district history, this this kind of just echoes a lot of some of the, uh, you know, short straws that Vernon Hills kind of historically has has felt that they've been given over the years. Um, but, you know, I realize there's no intent, malintent whatsoever. And you guys make a beautiful graduation event over at the high school and it is special. And so is Liberty Bells and I've had the privilege of attending both now. Um, but, you know, short of saying, well, then let's bring LHS's home and put the overflow in the auditorium. I just don't know how we carry on this way because now that we know what we know, you know, um, going forward, it will look highly inequitable if we keep it this way from, from my vantage. Um, this is a this is a momentous occasion for many families. And I think it's particularly when we look at our demographics at Vernon Hills, it's a highly momentous occasion for many of our students and their families. Um, and I'm not going to, you know, pretend that the demographics at our two schools are the same. They're not. And people want to be together. People want to celebrate the achievements of their graduates. This is what we as a district work toward every single day is producing graduates that are daring. And if we don't offer space for families to feel that they can celebrate that fully and with everyone that's important in that student's life in attendance, like our, our students over at LHS do have the opportunity to do, then I just don't think it's right by the community. Well, I would say at this point, I would need to know more of what the whole community is actually looking for because 15 letters is not is a sample, but it does not speak for the whole community. So I agree. And if that is what the community wants, I so I under I do not see this as an inequity unless it is. And I don't think we have enough information to make that certain you know, decision right now. Uh, and I I don't see how you make a decision without asking without knowing more and if that is what the majority of the community is feeling i've been made aware oh i'm sorry i think i just cut you off that not at all okay. i just i had that feeling that it was just going this I'm, way <laughs> i'm taking it back up you go right ahead um i've been made aware of a petition that's circulating currently if that makes a difference i've been pinged personally about this numerous times over the last few weeks. Um, again, sometimes when you don't know what you don't know and it comes to light, that's when you suddenly have movement that didn't exist before. And so, you know, all it takes is, is some people who are aware and to spread awareness and to, uh, you know, inspire action and in others to really get the ball rolling, so to speak. And I think that's what we're witnessing here. And I, I, I really appreciate that involvement from our community and, and their concern. Can I just briefly echo Kara's comment, though, that we're not sure it's not equitable because we don't have enough information. And I would, I would say people are maybe informed, but I think the understanding of the differences in the venues, the fact that their child that may have been involved in music doesn't get to perform 
the fact that they have to drive 45 to 55 minutes to get there, the fact that it's they're you know hundreds of feet from their their student and they have to watch them on the big screen because they're so far away. There's there's just and I'm again I'm not defending one or the other. I'm just trying to point out there are differences between the two venues, and there are good things and there are bad things. And I think uh, a number of people are thinking, oh, they get this. It costs more, must be better. Isn't necessarily the case. It's just different. I appreciate that. I, I just, I worry, again, if this isn't cost prohibitive and we're still saying no, and absolutely not. I don't think anybody's, I don't think saying, anybody's saying no. So I, I would not. Oh, I mean, I'm just, hypothetically, if it's kind of, sounding like we're not moving in that direction, then then it does start to creep into not equitable territory. Yeah, I, and I don't John think anyone's saying right now and said, we really need to change this. I think that we would change it. Yeah, Great. Yeah. Well, I don't and think I it's think a case we, of equity at all. I think it's a yeah. case of preference. And I think John has stated his preference. I'm not exactly sure why we're still talking about it. <laughs> well, and I think the difficulty if I learned anything from COVID is that we'll have a group of parents and um, they insist they represent the majority. And that may or may not be the case, but regardless of whether or not it's the case, the building and the administration and the board are ultimately left to make that decision. So I don't wanna create a, everybody gets a vote and we're gonna go with the highest vote getter because that's not the best way to make the best decision. I, I'm not sure that doing nothing is the right way to go though. I think if we're aware that there is um, there's some concern about this, then doing nothing is not really the answer. We, we have to do something, we have to look into it. Um, I don't know what that protocol is, but I also don't think that it's our job to say how how we're going to look into it as long as there is a commitment that we are going to examine it and that the board is going to get an update on what data you decided to use, how you, how you made a decision, what, what, what the decision is going forward. Um, I just, I'm not sure that we're in a position to, to impose. I don't think we have enough information. What that, no. what that's going to be. Nor do I want to be looking at it through the lens of we spent this on this school, therefore we have to spend this on this school. That's that's not yeah. how we've made decisions. That's not how we make decisions, and that's not has nothing to do with equity. And let's put this in perspective. This is important, but this is not impacting <clears throat> student learning. There would be some urgency around this if there was a significant investment per student that was creating a different outcome in the classroom. That, that would be a different situation. We'd be having a different conversation. Um, while this is important, um, let's just keep it in, in perspective. Okay. Any other comments? We'll look forward to an update on that. Moving on to bid recommendations, continuing our summer maintenance work, uh, starting with LHS washrooms. Yeah, so we uh, received two bids for the washrooms. The low bid was Ephraim Carlson, 372,000. The estimate we had was 500,000, so this came in well under, which is great. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, when you add in the design costs, um, the total cost for the project is gonna be just under 400,000. Um, so yeah, this brings our total for the summer capital to about 3.9 million, which is under the 4 million that we had estimated, you know, back in, I always forget this day, January, January. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we would, we would recommend this to be approved at the, okay. What month is next, it? March, next March Monday. Yeah, it's next Monday, mm -hmm. 20th. All right, so that will come up for approval next week. Uh, bid recommendation for the LHS asbestos abatement in line with the washrooms. Uh, yep, so the, similarly, uh, we have received two bids. A little bit was Colfax, 49,900. 
Um, we estimated the total cost of that project would be about 75,000. So it's gonna end up being you know, about 58,500, which is great. Um, yeah. To an extent, I mean, like we want it to be close to what we're estimating. So, we're, you know, the intention is not to have come in under budget a ton, but I'd rather be under than over. Yes. I'd rather well, be in, close to exact, but. In context, we say this quite frequently, but it, it bears repeating when there is a disparity between what you estimate and it, what the bid actually, what, what the bid actually winds up to be, whether it's less or more, you guys walk through the scope of the project with the respective bid winner and make sure that you're all on the same page. You do that every time to make sure that um, yeah. the numbers line up. Sometimes so. it comes in under, sometimes it comes in over. Right. We're hoping in aggregate it stays within what we're expecting. And so far, it's working out. Okay. Uh, so we'll see that up for approval uh, next week. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to D, LHS wheelchair lift replacement. So this, uh, we thought it was going to be 50000 The final quote came in 44124 uh, it's less than that, so this is not something uh, that state law would require us to bid. Uh, so we're bringing it forward, and there's not many people that do this thing, um, so it's difficult to find wheelchair lift manufacturers that can create a lift to this commercial level that we're looking for. Uh, so we feel comfortable moving forward with this one. Um, yeah, and there'll be one I'm going to mention in future agenda items too, so I won't forget. Okay. Is the, is the wheelchair lift currently operational? Just out of curiosity. Currently it is, but we are constantly repairing it. Um, okay. Over the last few years, we spent several thousand dollars, uh, and now parts are hard to get. Um, last year, we had to replace a board on it um, you know, to get us through, and they were able to find us a used board to get us through. So, yeah, it's, it's past its useful life. Okay, yeah, and it's costing us more money to keep repairing it, so mm -hmm. this is an important one. Okay, uh, again, we'll see that next week uh, for, up for approval. Uh, moving on to item E, capital project prioritization, our ongoing process. Yeah, I won't read through again what I wrote, so I'll just assume you've read it. So we're in, we're in the middle of a process that I think is going really well. Um, and so our hope was to have a finalized prioritized list for today. That is not happening. Uh, so we missed that goal. However, I feel very comfortable with the track of getting this in April. Um, I think it really was, I think the, the core of it was the committee going through the two test projects that were submitted and the people that submitted them saying like, this is this needs to get changed. This is too much. And this is not quite where we really want. Everyone really agreed that that was, that was the case. So we talked about changes. I think we have a very, um, what would you call it? A spelt option that kind of it's this this well, like this, <laughs> this very um i think a, a good marriage of simplicity but also detail and a process that gets us what we want to know um quicker and so we're looking forward to that i'm getting projects i just got another one submitted today so we're getting more and more and they'll be due or then we can get as many as are submitted between now and monday okay a week from today so no, that's great. This is this is very important to have an object, objective way to review the capital projects that are necessary in our district because there there's never going to be enough money to do everything. We have to have a way to evaluate in an object, objective manner. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely subjectivity to it, but there's criteria associated with that, which I think removes hopefully removes some bias from the process and makes it look it makes it a more fair process. Um, with that, though, I want I did want to touch on, um, you know, we were asked about what's going on with Verici and the the V Turk, um, and so part of that process, when we last went through with Verici, they kind of gave us an overall summary of where the whole um, township was in terms of different projects and ideas, and the sense I had at the time from us is, well, we need to figure out what's important to us, and so we need to see what comes out of this project, this process, to say what is what is most important is. A project that aligns to some of the things the Verigi is looking at doing is that the most important project for us? If it is, then that makes perfect sense to align ourselves with Verigi and move forward uh, with those. Um, but if it's not, let's say you know it's something else that comes up that is a higher priority, then we wouldn't match up with Verigi. So I felt like I, I I really feel that we need to get this process ironed out to figure out what is our what is our priority or what does the data show our priority is and then see if there's connection with the things that they're interested in doing. 
or you know that that's in their lane i guess you could say in terms of doing that so um that's really the update like they're they want to know too like and i would love to tell them but i don't have that information yet um just because we're not through this process so okay. that would be all the information i have right now any comments or discussion i'm continually looking forward to trying to see if we can do some of those energy energy saving projects. So I did ask Pam to speak to this tonight. Um, but I, I would actually like to see some of those projects on the capital plan at some point, because I, I keep looking through that capital plan and I don't see solar installation. I don't see uh, you know lighting upgrades or any of the things that Verity talked about. Um, so right now to me, those are still off somewhere like they can't be a part of the process if they're not on the plan uh well and they're never getting out of the plan unless they get proposed i'm proposing that yes. we put solar on our buildings so, yeah and so i'm just the the, pro, the process is so like most of the stuff we have on our list is about, about health and safety issues that get brought up or asset replacement like that's going to be the where most of our things come from and the rest is going to be through this process so it needs it needs you need someone to submit the project through the process to do that. So I've already said that I'm gonna do the the solar on Vernon Hills, but if there are other other projects or even, you know, I don't know if there are other projects that the board wants submitted through this process now, or if you see what kind of comes and this says, you know what, I feel like something's missing. I'm not sure what you wanna do, um, but I'm happy to do what the board wants. Well, we did the lighting upgrade at Vernon Hills High School. I wonder if, just putting it on the list to do at LHS. Right. Whether or not it makes it through the priority matrix. Uh, there, there was a project submitted. Vergi suggested like, mm -hmm. I can't remember. It was yeah. an astronomical sum. It was like million. 13 million dollars worth of projects that we obviously cannot pay for all of those. But some of those projects do pay us back. Um, and so getting those projects, like what, what's that balancing point? If we wait 10 years, then and we save $100,000 a year, was it worth it to wait 10 years? So and I don't I don't have the answer for where that balancing point is, but I would like to see them on a schedule someplace so that we can so that they're in our minds. Yeah, and I guess a little, as far as I'm concerned, a little clarity on, obviously those come from the building and from the district, but is it appropriate for the board to say, hey, I, I'd like to add solar, or I'd like to add composting, or I'd like to add a lighting right. upgrade? Is, yeah. is that appropriate for change us? Change the infrastructure for waste management, uh, change infrastructure, superstructure for uh, water management. Like and those might not wind up rising to the top in any given year, but is that something that we're comfortable with doing? No? Well, maybe not even that, that we request, but maybe we request, we, you know, go back to the the team and say, hey, can you just take a look down this entire list and tell me, you know, do a first blush, what might be viable projects, what might be things that we should be doing and make a recommendation of the things that you think are most appropriate based on your knowledge of the building. And, and you know, maybe Mark could, could run down the list, maybe somebody else, but just to, to sort of take that list and parse it out to those things. Yeah, we can't do all 13 million, but there's probably things on there that we either could or should be doing and just get them on the list. I mean, it, it's even if they wind up at the bottom <laughs> each year, at least we know they're, they're considered and there are things that are of interest. Um, to at least some of the board members. I, I also see two other things. Yes. I see um, Don, this is one of your passions and it's something that you know is something we want to model for our students. So not only is it important to you, you think that this is an important behavior and way we should model for our students in our community of being good stewards. 
So it's a, a pretty big picture thing. I think the other thing I'm hearing is who at the district is also advocating for this. And if you don't feel there's an advocate at the table, then that doesn't feel comfortable for you. I think the third thing that just popped into my mind is what Lisa said about how can we um, do touch points or gather that information from the board on things that, again, your elected officials to represent, especially capital outlay needs. We're bringing the educational perspective <clears throat> and some other things, but I think this is an opportunity not for you to say this nitpicky thing, but I think we really need to be investing more money here or here or here. And that's, I think that's a natural part of it. How can we take when an individual board member makes an advocacy to say, is that what all of you want? Um, I'm used to having that be some sort of a, a protocol we have so that it doesn't feel like one single board member's voice is asking for something that they might have the impetus. But once that is sort of surfaced, we then consider it and say, yes. And then we give me or Dan or whoever a directive to consider yeah. that particular input. Because I think right now it's it's feeling... Well, this conversation started in 2018 before I was right. elected to the board. I sat at committee meetings over there beforehand and listened. And we were, I think the board was moving that direction. And then COVID happened and then things went crazy. But I mean, it's in my mind, we've been at this for almost five years now. But we yeah. haven't had a process. And like Denise yeah. suggests, right. perhaps our process could be if one of us has an idea, we put it on the agenda for committee. We discuss it as a group. And if there's consensus that this is something we're interested in, we give it to you and then it makes it onto the list. To be fair, I did ask it to be on the agenda a month ago, and it's not on the agenda. So I, that process is apparently not working. Yeah, no, yeah. that you're you're right about that, and that falls on me. And I apologize for that. That was a short uh, that was short sighted of me not to include it. So I apologize. And and I wouldn't even go as far as uh, Denise. You mentioned you know if we feel that there's something we want to invest in, I wouldn't even go that far as much as I think Don what you're asking is get it on the list to be prioritized right and the experts tell us if it's worth investing in and then we'll take that that feedback and 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 move on appropriately but if it's something that we've discussed and we say oh we think these are good projects we should be doing but just never get around to talking about them or doing them then maybe this pro this new vetting process for capital projects just put them on the list, see where they go. Maybe right. there's a couple that'll pop to the top. I wouldn't even use the word prioritized. I, I would want them to tell me where where exactly. it falls in, in the priority it, as that's, far as where yeah, the that's my is. point. That's a, you know we <laughs> raised the the ideas, but we shouldn't be. That's what this whole new process is supposed to be doing. My only thought, kind of going back to the original with Veraji was. Is there a way for us to say when we are doing a project, can we tick off some of the boxes from an idea standpoint? For example, I'm looking at the bathroom here, right? We're remodeling bathrooms. Are there any ideas from the Verigi work <laughs> that we can use when we remodel that bathroom? Like you get more efficient lights, you get more efficient toilets, water systems, whatever it is. I mean, that way you're kind of inching towards that goal, even if we can't afford doing the big project, can you add on maybe a small percentage and, and kind of move us in that direction for everything we do? It's the only other thing that came to mind. We are following a philosophy. So yep. all our new lighting is LED, uh, lower, efficiency, lower efficiency, and um, our toilets are low volume flushing as well as our mechanism. So we are following that footsteps in, in everything we do with our projects. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Dan is thinking. I am. Well, we're putting a million dollar roof on. Like, right, exactly. So in what? that million dollar roof, were we, and I, I think that we have talked to them about that. Is that the same roof that they're taking all the rocks off of? Mm -hmm. Right, because we had that conversation with Verigi while we were up on that roof. 
if we were to put solar up here, would the new roof support that weight? So I, at least at some point that conversation occurred because I don't know if you've seen this roof, but it has like river stones on top of it, thousands of pounds of river stones. Well, once that weight is gone, then we should surely be able to yeah, put solar on roof set, Yeah, roof six, all the roofs at the existing roofs, except for ones we've done at Vernon Hills are called ballasted roofs, where it's just fastened around the edges and you lay all the heavy stone. The theory was the stone keeps the sun off, increases the life um, of the roof, but the more you walk on it, you know, they are round stones, but they're not all perfectly round. Um, you know, the roofs do, um, they last a little bit longer, um, but now we take that balance and weight off. So now it comes to, uh, we have to have an engineer come in and check our trusses and our in sections of different sections of the building um, might be able to support it. Now, over the educational section, great chance. Over the main gyms, not so sure because of the span. Um, we are reducing weight, but what is, you know, what is the difference? Um, and what's the wind load? Um, so, um, right. you know, we, so can, we can proceed with that, with the engineering. You know, um, just an Alice point, while we were considering putting the million dollar roof on, were we considering the load that would go on if we were to put solar? Like, is that just a constant filter that we have anytime we make a decision about how we're going to proceed that we look at what are the possibilities for yeah. uh, so our, our water new, savings for flushing toilets or whatever. Yeah. Our new roofs um, will be fully ballasted. They're done, they're, they're glued down. Um, so they, you know, it's a matter of um, if you want to put solar on there, it's a matter of we just have to make the connections through the roof uh, to fasten the solar and, and also get the electricity done. So those can be modified. And obviously you want to do it on, on the roof, you know, uh, the newest roofs that you can. Right. Okay. And I, I don't recall seeing when we reviewed that bid if anything was at, if we asked that question. Right. I, I don't know either. And obviously in Vernon Hills, you know, Dan ensured, you know, Vernon Hills, the the new gym addition is solar ready. It was the roof was engineered to make sure they could handle the ballast and the weight of the solar panels. So what I'm hearing is you are making those decisions through that lens as best you can. As best you can, yes. In a new okay. new building that was all set and engineered, uh, so we're ready. Um it could kind of come down to how much solar can we put on the roof, depending on the truss size. You know, you might think you, oh, we could fill up this whole roof um, because of span, because of this, uh, you can only fill, you know, do three quarters of it or half of it. So, you know, that we'd have to work out when that, you know, when we come to that, that point, that would be part of the engineering. Well, we would definitely depend on you as the expert to <clears throat> help us understand our limitations when it comes to energy efficient modifications, uh, limitations and possibilities. Mm -hmm. so, any other thoughts? Okay. Moving on to F, <clears throat> disposal of equipment that will also come up for the vote next week if anybody needs a tractor. <laughs> Is it going cheap? Anything to say about that? No. Okay. Um, that ends items for discussion. Um, moving on to future agenda items. It's like we have some budget calendar information in April, some resolutions in May, as well as our Lake County indemnification agreement. Anything yeah. else to add? Uh, yeah, side? our intention is on at the March board meeting. We we actually got it, what, today? Yeah, this morning. Uh, the scoreboard, the pricing for, to replace the scoreboard at Vernon Hills, okay. which is part of our summer capital. Um, that's 54822 and we were estimating 55 so it's close. And is that a project Pretty that's close. running through the new matrix, the spelt new matrix? Uh, <laughs> nope. So let me let me reframe back. So this this list of projects that was developed 
um, over the winter and presented to the board in January. That was developed outside of this prioritization process um, because that process was not figured out yet. And so at that time, what I informed the board was, we agree that this process is important. However, it's not done yet. And so we, the, the ship still has to keep moving. We need to do projects for the summer. We are going to have to follow our same methodology last year of really Mark telling me what the projects need to be after looking at all the data that he looks at. So that's how we generated the list back in January. Um, so uh, to answer your question, no, that's not part of it. This is part of a scheduled end of life replacement for the scoreboard. Fair enough, uh, understood. You know, Thank we, you. We categorized our projects for the summer. We went over the list and we categorized them as either health and safety or uh, asset preservation and of use of life. Okay. For everything that we've got on our list. So we'll see the scoreboard next week mm -hmm. for a vote as well. It, for approval, yeah, yeah. it's through the co-op co -op, co -op pricing. Uh, so it's over 50,000. So it requires bid, but through the co-op, it's already bid <clears throat> through that process. And so okay. that'll come for approval. Um, so letting you know that that'll be there. Um, so you're not surprised. And then in terms of budget calendar, um, what I'll give you in April is a draft to um, hopefully have our fiscal 24 or have our budget done sooner than we ever have before. So we've got a lot of things in place to allow us to do that. We have a teacher contract. We've got a staffing plan. Um, almost all the staff, we'll have the ESP next month. You know, So we'll have a lot of things in place that fully equip us to be able to figure this out and get everything tied up sooner than we had before, which Great. just helps everybody involved to kind of know you know, what's the plan for next year sooner uh, rather than later. So I'm excited for that. Um, and then we have our, some of our year end uh, transfers that we'll, I'll give you in due time. Okay. Any other agenda items, future agenda items? <clears throat> Sonal keeps pointing at you. Do you have an agenda item? I don't item? specifically other than, you know, our continued discussion that we just had. So that's, I, I'm not formally asking for us to put an agenda item on our next because Dan has informed us that he is working on the solar project and that that will go on the list and then it'll be something that I'll see next time the capital projects comes up. Okay. Okay. Well, that adjourns F and F at 916.